All right, I'm ready. Great. Let's roll. Okay, you're starting out, right, Teamer? Yeah. Great. Are we live? Now we are. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the audio program, our virtual meetup. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, thank you also for the feedback that you gave us. Um, that's amazing. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Timur. Um, we are actually doing this for the fifth time now um, and for the fourth time completely online. So yeah, it's really, really exciting to be here. We again have three amazing guests for you tonight. Um, four. Yeah, four, well, two hosts and three guests and I'm also going to be doing a talk in the end. So yes. Um, <laughs> Right. So yeah, thanks for tuning in. My name is Timur and um, I am your host together with Josh. Hello, Josh. How are you doing today? I'm great. I'm in a uh, I'm in between houses at the moment. So uh, I'm in a different location. Uh, so big shout out to my friend Jaguar Skills, who has graciously lended me his studio. And uh, yeah, so here we are. Am I supposed to keep going? <laughs> Um, <laughs> was that over to me? I didn't realize that. Uh, so to, yeah. Yeah, great. So, um, <laughs> yes. So, so, uh, yes, I'd like to, uh, let's give thanks to our sponsors. So we have juice focus, right. And Sonox that have, uh, helped support the audio programmer meetups. And we'd like to give thanks to them and thank you to all of you for joining us. And we hope to have a fantastic meeting tonight. Um, as Timur said, we have four guests tonight. We have, uh, Evan Murray, who is a student at Georgia Tech University. We have Sean Costello, who is the creator of Valhalla DSP. We have Jean Miguel Salarier, who is an engineer for OSEOScore, which is an open source DAW. And we have our very own Timur Dumler, who is giving a talk for us today as well. So I guess we can start things off. All right. So I could just start with the word question in all caps, like question in big letters, and then your question, then it's making it a lot easier for us to spot the questions and to make sure that we can ask it. So if you could help us out in that way, that would be great. Um, so let's see if this works. Um, and without further ado, I want to introduce our first speaker, which um, Josh, as Josh already said, um, our first speaker is Evan Murray. Hello, Evan. How are you doing today? So, doing pretty good. Great. Um, so yeah, you're studying music technology at the Georgia Institute of Technology, um, yes. as Josh already said, and you are, have been doing some programming on the Game Boy Advance. Um, yeah. So that's really exciting. Today you're going to talk to us about how that went and what you learned from that. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. We're looking forward to that. Great. So we have a pre-recorded talk from Evan today, and then we're going to do a Q and A afterwards. So just a reminder that. If you have a question, be sure to type in big letters, question, and then ask your question so we can ask it afterwards for Evan. And without further delay, here we are. Hi, everyone. My name's Evan, and I'm a student at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And as a person who studies music technology, I thought it would be a good idea to try and make sound with my Game Boy. How did I get the idea to do this? A couple months ago, my brother came over to the house to go through his stuff, and one of the things he pulled out was his old Game Boy Advance. He had some interest in it, but then gave it to me when he saw my eyes widen. I played some of my favorite games on it for a couple of days, and then a thought popped into my head. This device is a gaming console, but it is also a computer. Therefore, it has to be programmable somehow. What programming language does it use? And could I program my own Game Boy Advance programs? I remember hearing there is a computer science course at my school which teaches Game Boy game development through C, and they use a tool called Tonk. So I head over to the Tonk website and I read through the introduction a little bit, and I recognize words such as make files. Make files, they were familiar to me, since I had previously used them to build my projects in hackathons or some example audio plugins that I tried building during the spring. And they're essentially a script which goes to the compiler and tells it what to do with all the source code. 
To get that compiled into a GBA file, I used a compiler called DevKit Arm, and this compiler is part of the DevKit Pro toolchain, which includes many other compilers for the 3DS, Nintendo Switch, and Nintendo DS. So after this GBA file is created by the compiler, it can be run through an emulator or directly on the Game Boy Advance using a flashcard. Once I was able to compile a few simple programs for the Game Boy Advance, then I started to learn audio programming on the device. Although you might be writing some code in C or C++, there is a lower level part of this process. On the Game Boy Advance, there's no such thing as an operating system. So when you're running sound programs, they're being processed directly by the CPU and sound registers, which control the sound hardware on the device. To get the Game Boy Advance sound chip to do certain things, you need to change different values stored inside different sound registers. And often it's hard to associate these registers just by their numbers and try to remember what each one does. But luckily, C gives us a useful tool to work around this challenge. In C and C++, you can use define directives to give a name to each register. Therefore, whenever I want to write a value to a register, I can treat it as a variable and have it be associated with a specific thing. This pattern of naming registers with defines is used in the Tonk library, so you can use those defines when you import the Tonk library into your code. Creating sound on the Game Boy Advance is all about setting the right values to the right sound registers. If you set an invalid value to a certain register, it may not work. For this reason, there are guides out there which help you identify the correct values to set for each register. One resource I used which helped me was belllogic.com. They have a whole memory map of all the sound registers and what bits you need to set for each one. This can be challenging to follow since each bit makes a difference in how the sound behaves. But if you try enough, you'll start to get the hang of things. Let's walk through creating a simple sound program in C. First, we'll import the Tonk library with the register defines into our code. Then we'll create an entry point, and inside that entry point, we follow these steps to set up the sound. We'll turn on the sound chip, then we'll set a master bus, and we'll do that by first picking what kind of wave we want. So with the original Game Boy, it came with one tone generator, which is a sweep, another tone generator, which doesn't have the sweep, and then a third tone generator, which can be a custom wave. And finally, a noise generator, which can be used for all the drum sounds. And then this wave, we can have it have a maximum volume of seven, so I'll set it to that. In the Game Boy Advance, how is it different from the original Game Boy? Well, you can load 8-bit audio files or you can use the four original pulse channels from the Dot Matrix Games Game Boy. And that's what that Dot Matrix Games is. It's the code name for the original Game Boy. But for now, I'm just going to use the DMG channel. So we'll set the DMG to audio ratio 100%. So it's all pulse channels. And then we're going to turn the tone one sweep function on and we'll build that sound in envelope. So we can set the max volume. There's You can set a volume from 0 to 12, and then does the envelope decay or increase 0 or 1? I'm going to choose decay, so we'll pick 0. And then a max step time. We have a max step time of 7, or you can do anywhere in between. I'm going to do, let's say, maybe 4. And then we can select the duty cycle. So what are the duty cycle? Well, the duty cycle is is how long that wave is being pulsed. And then finally, we'll initialize the sound frequency to zero. So now we just need a way to play our sound. To do this, we'll create an infinite while loop at a controlled speed, which periodically checks to see if a certain button is being pressed. And when that button is pressed, we'll have our sound be played. So in this example, I'll use the A button. Okay, great, now let's write a function that plays the note. So when the note is played, what we need to do, we need to first reset the frequency of the sound, and then we need to set the frequency and octave, which are loaded into the function. Lastly, we run this function whenever the A button is pressed. Okay, so now that we have our program, to turn this code into a Game Boy Advance program, 
we need to use a makefile template. And that's included inside the Tonk code folder, which you can download from the Tonk website. And once we have the template, we can just edit it and insert the location of where the Tonk libraries are installed on our system. And it's also important to run these two commands that tell make where the devkit arm compiler is located. And once those two steps are done, we can run make inside the folder to generate a GBA file. And then we can put that GBA file on a micro SD card or run it through an emulator. And I'm gonna choose to put it on the SD. So once we load that SD into this flash cartridge, we can just play it like a regular Game Boy game. So let's go ahead and see how this sounds. All right, so here we have it, the flash card. Then we go to the program. It's a blank screen because we didn't do any graphics. But if we press the A button, hey, there's the sound. And you'll notice we set the sweep function to be on, but it's not playing because I haven't actually set it up. I'll go over that in maybe a future video, but I don't have time to do it here. So we'll just skip over that for now. Making simple sounds is fun and all, especially once you've mastered them. However, many professional games will use other digital signal processing tactics to manipulate the sounds. I noticed one of my favorite games, Super Mario Advance, used a vibrato effect in one of the minigame songs. The idea of figuring out how to implement this effect was like finding a treasure chest. It took me two days. I sat down during the evening and thought logically through what was happening with the sound during the vibrato. It was essentially sweeping the frequency up and down multiple times. Isn't that what the sweep tone generator is for? Well, I tried using it, but it was too difficult to control. Maybe I could try to sweep the frequency manually. I just needed a way to control the time of the sweep. The GBA CPU runs too fast for an effect to be noticed. So to get around this challenge, I tried something which worked the refresh rate of the screen, or the V-blank, and that happens around 60 times a second, or 60 hertz. So I decided I could create a couple of loops and change the frequency inside of them. How would I be able to control the speed? Well, to make the vibrato go slower, I would just increment or decrement the frequency, say by one. And if I wanted to make it go faster, I might change the frequency by a value of 5 or 10 each time the loop goes through. And I could increase that to whatever I wanted to until the vibrato is eventually going super fast that you can't even tell that it's vibrato. It just sounds like its own frequency. I was so happy when I figured this out, but I wasn't satisfied yet. The same day, I was playing another one of my favorite games, 102 Dalmatians, which is a Game Boy Color game. And this game also used some fancy audio effects such as quick arpeggios. After listening to the arpeggios, I realized they are similar to the vibrato. The only difference is that through the loop, the frequency is changed discreetly to different notes instead of frequencies in between. I tried implementing this effect after thinking about this, and I was able to get it to work in a little less than an hour. After messing around with my Game Boy Advance for a couple of weeks, I was still left with a couple of questions. Why is retro music still popular these days, and how can we combine it with modern technology? Well, there's this book I'm reading which describes the phenomenon of how certain music may bring up feelings like nostalgia or memories from our childhood. Some of these memories are positive and create a desire for retro gear. And because of this, there's several YouTube channels which still focus on retro equipment. In addition to creating nostalgia, the 8-bit square waves and noises are harmonically pleasing to some ears. And there's even a market for these types of sounds in music. For example, a company called Teenage Engineering sells a product called Pocket Operator Arcade, which has a collection of 8-bit sounds. This train of thought brings me to our next topic. What is the function of retro music in modern music? And could we expand the timbre and expression of retro music through modern tools? The answer is yes, we are limited by the sound parameters the Game Boy Advance provides us in the data dimensions, which are 8-bit. However, we can change those parameters in any way we wish. In fact, there is a product called the Arduino Boy, which allows the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance sound engine to be controlled through MIDI.
and this can be useful for keyboards and it also opens the doors for more expression. Personally, I came up with an idea to combine AudioKit, a tool for developing mobile music applications, and sounds from my Game Boy, and this allowed me to create a Game Boy instrument on my iPhone. Eventually, I'd like to have AudioKit control the Game Boy directly, but for now, I am using pre-recorded sounds. I'm looking forward to the future things I discover with Game Boy music, and I'll be posting updates on my YouTube channel, EV Music, if you're interested in following. But thank you for coming to this talk. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot. And now I'll be taking some questions. Wow, thank you so much. <clears throat> Pardon me. Thank you so much, Evan, for that brilliant talk. And yes, we're gonna take some questions. What questions do yeah. we have, Timur? Yeah, so we have a few questions on the chat. Thank you, by the way. Thank you so much for the talk. That's really cool stuff. You're welcome. Um, um, yeah. Um, so one question from uh, Stu. Um, so on the Game Boy programming, wouldn't the frequency define the octave um, so that A's are 440, 880, etc.? What's the purpose of the octave? I'd say the purpose of the octave is just to sort of make things easier because a lot of the times as a musician, that's kind of at least how I think as a musician, some musicians, they might think in frequency, especially when involving tuning. But in my case, it's just easier to think in octaves and Tonk already had the defines for that. That's great. I I actually had a question. What, where was the original vision to start on assembler rather than starting right away with something um, that has higher level of abstractions like audio kit or, or juice? Where, where did that uh, motivation start from? It actually came from when I was around in fifth grade, I got this card called an action replay. And basically this device that allowed me to enter in cheat codes on video games. And I had no idea how the thing actually worked until like a couple of years ago. Then I found out, okay, it's actually changing the certain addresses in the game, like maybe once for the score or something. And I just thought that was really cool. So it kind of inspired this stuff. And, and had, you, have, had you been programming before university? Because one thing that I think is that as a second year student, your, your programming skills are quite advanced. You've gone a lot deeper than most students are. Uh, I know I was nowhere near this when I was in my second year. So uh, were, you, were you developing before you went to university? Yeah, I've, like I said, <laughs> since fifth grade, I've kind of been interested in computers and then Around eighth grade, I was curious on how I could make my own app. So I always wanted to make an iPhone app. So I got a developer account and started learning Swift. And that was one of the first programming languages I learned. Very interesting. All right. Yeah, we have a few more questions. Um, so Mark is asking, does the hardware ever, is the hardware ever different from the emulator in terms of the sound produced? I've noticed a couple things in also there were some bugs where the, the emulator would work. Like one of the times I was trying to program it and I was programming the wave channel and I got a sound like kind of like the startup of the, not the Game Boy Advance, but the Game Boy Color where it's like, it's kind of this certain sound and yeah, it's just sometimes the emulator handles things differently. But then if you try it on the Game Boy, it will actually crash if there's something wrong and it just won't work at all. But that's really the only difference I notice. The sound is pretty much identical. That's interesting. And that actually leads to the next question, which is whether you have any plans to program on the original Game Boy. Yeah, I've thought about it. I know that the, the flashcards are harder to get a hold of. I know the Game Boy Advance is common because it, it's the easy Flash Omega, but I've definitely thought about it and I think it'd be useful to combine both the Game Boy and Game Boy Advance, so that way I could have more channels for sound. So actually, I have a question here. So the original Game Boy, does it have the same sound chip? I think it has like less things it can do, right? Yes, I spent about a, a week researching that because I was just mm -hmm. curious about it. And there's not really any details on what sound chip it uses. But I've talked to my dad. He 
he was in the semiconductor industry for like 20 mm -hmm. years. And so he was telling me how even one chip can contain multiple integrated circuits. So what I'm thinking is that there seems to be no reason that it, the programmable sound generator in the Game Boy would be different from the Game Boy Advance. And I think they both include the same chip, but it's just that the Game Boy Advance also has two audio stream channels. So you can load audio files. Yeah, that's really exciting. You know, I have to admit, actually, when I was that age, I wasn't into the Game Boy. I was, I had like a Game Gear, which was the Sega one, which had, oh, yeah. it was like in 99. And so, yeah, when I was like seven years old, I was really addicted to that. And then later, much later, I looked into that a little bit. Um, like, what would it take to like write like a sound emulator for the Game Gear? And it, it was a bit different. It had like, I think, three channels and a noise generator, but there were some differences to what you were saying. But I never actually had the time to look into it properly. But now, actually, you motivated me to go back there and like spend a bit more time with this because it seems to be so much fun. It really is. Yeah. It's we um right um so we have one more question actually um i think um so jack is saying uh first of all thanks for the great talk so um can you talk about the georgia tech program um like i guess he's as okay that's a bit of an off-topic question i'm not sure if you need to do, like uh maybe you should take this offline i don't i'm not sure um but oh there's someone who's asking the same question like can you maybe yeah, just say like a sentence yeah. or two about the program where you're studying because people seem to be really interested in that. Yeah, so the the program they have at Georgia Tech, you can, everybody's a music technology major because that's what the program is, but there's different concentrations. And the one I'm interested in doing is uh, minor in computer science. So that's kind of the area of study that I'll be doing and probably taking some programming classes later on. But you can also do things like mechanical engineering. And also, I think there's acoustics, a lot of different other routes that you can go. But yeah, it's a great program so far for the first year. All right. Well, yeah, sounds like fun. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Evan. Thank you so much for this uh, really interesting uh, presentation. That was really <laughs> Thank you for having fun. me. Um, all right. Moving on, um, we have uh, Jean-Michel Célérier, um, who is um, a software developer and the creator of the software Ossia Score, uh, which is a digital artwork station. So that sounds really interesting. So Jean-Michel is going to present the software, talk about the engine architecture that's under the hood. And yeah, hey, Jean-Michel, I'm sure it's going to be uh, really exciting. And actually, you are giving a talk oh. live. So this is a new yep. for us. Okay. <laughs> Until now, we always had pre-recorded talks, so now we're going to try live talks. So, what could possibly go wrong? Um, but yeah, Jean-Michel, welcome. Cool. So, well, first, thanks for having me. Super appreciated. Um, just, I'll set up the screen sharing. Um, my other. Okay. So my screen should be shared. Cool. Um, so yeah. So. Hello, everyone. So to quickly present me, I'm Jean-Michel. I'm from France in Bordeaux. So hello, everyone. And hello, there are some people from Bordeaux in the stream. I know there are some. And tonight, I'm going to talk about OSIA score and the OSIA project. So OSIA is a project that was started a long time ago. Like I was eight years old, so I was definitely not there for the first steps. But I joined it in 2014 uh, for a PhD thesis. And it's a project about um, basically doing what we usually do with audio in music sequencers, but extending it to other kind of media like video, but also control of other software, control of robots, that kind of thing. So yeah, so this talk will be mostly about introducing OSIA, which is an open source project. Everything is LGPL or GPL, which means free software that you can use and everything is free and explaining all the architect at architectural choices, in particular, considering that most of the code was developed during the PhD. So there were very tight timing constraints, that kind of thing. So how did we manage to make something that starts working in a relatively short amount of time? And what does the software bring to the audio ecosystem? Let's see about that. So this talk is about audio and in general, multimedia software architecture. 
and some details at the end with modern C++. So the whole thing is written in C++ and I tried my best to use the latest standards whenever I could. So I'll have a small rant or retrospective on whether this was a good choice or not, but I'll spoil it was a good choice, I think. Um, very important thing. So this is live talk. Feel free to interrupt me at any point. I have, I'll keep the YouTube chat uh, under my eyes. So you, you can just ask questions and maybe if Timur or Joshua can ping me on the stream if there is a question I'm missing because I'm, it, that's what it's for. And most importantly, cheers everyone, big thanks to each other and big thanks to Josh and Timur and this meetup which is a very nice thing to exist, especially in this corona times. So uh, what is OSIA? Um, so that will be the first thing, that's my table of contents. Then we'll see the, the software architecture and you can follow at the top the little, where we are in the presentation. Following the C++ ecosystem, closing words. Okay, let's go. Um, I will first start by doing a demonstration. And so be aware that I will be doing the demonstration on my very alpha current version. So there will likely be crashes, but I think it's important to first show the software so that we all understand what we're talking about. Um, so where is it? Oh, where is it? Where is it? Um, okay. Okay, so uh, this is OSIA, so can we see it? Uh, let me just check the stream. Yep, it's fine. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so this software is uh, basically a timeline, so you, you all, I guess most of you at least know sequencers like Cubase, that kind of thing, Ableton Live. So the difference is that in OSIA, you don't have the, what, what is the most basic thing in timeline, which is tracks, that is, in OSIA, you don't have, let's say, your drum track, your, but you have, let's say, smaller tracks that you can compose in time. And basically, it's a tool to orchestrate various timelines. So you can drag and create timelines like this and move them. And then you can, of course, drag and drop, let's say, uh, some sounds or whatever. So this creates a few sound files that I'm dragging from the library of um, Bitwig, which is a very nice DAO. Um, so yeah, so this is a very simple composition of sounds. And uh, I'll just have to connect that. Connect. And if I play back, hopefully we should hear. Can the stream, is there any sound on the stream? I don't hear it. Uh, but... oh, okay. Okay, so here I'm playing back. All right, so you should be hearing some sound. And as you can see, there are not one, but multiple timelines and these timelines can all have their individual speed. For instance, I'm slowing down the first one. But um, the main point of that software was that it was created mostly for not recording music. For instance, the software doesn't even have an export feature. You, you can't save your things. You, well, you can save the project, but you can't export a web file or something because it is made for live shows, that is, it's used only in interactive context, in concerts, in performance arts, that kind of thing. And to that effect, we have a couple of fun features. The first one being the interactive trigger. So the interactive trigger is something that says, okay, at this point, I want to wait until some kind of external event happens until I continue to the next part of my score. So here, if I play again, it goes here, then it plays this little sound and then it stops there and I have to trigger something manually for the thing to play. So by default, there is a one bar quantification that I can disable to make things faster. And I could even cut what's before like that. So the timelines can basically branch in various ways and it is very nonlinear system. So 
if you know, for instance, Ableton Live's Clip Launcher, imagine that it is a kind of merging between both the timeline and the clip launching view of Ableton Live. That is, you can both have sequenced parts and sequenced sub parts of your score and also things that are triggered live, but the main view is still pretty much a timeline. The second important thing is um, conditions. So you can say, for instance, at some point, um, I want this to only play if some condition is true. And so I'm talking of these external events, conditions, that kind of thing. What can they be? Well, what you will most likely be aware of is MIDI. For instance, you can just say, when I press OK on my MIDI keyboard, well, it will trigger that thing. But um, OSIA being a tool for mostly live shows, it also supports a lot of other protocols. This leads us to the second, war, second part of the software, the Device Explorer, which is at the left. At the left, uh, uh, we can add devices, and that opens a small window. In this window, we can see a list of protocol. For instance, OSC, some of you may know it. Uh, MIDI input, MIDI output. I don't have any MIDI device plugged in. But also, you can use your serial port. For instance, if you have an Arduino, you can just uh, plug it to your uh, by USB and start using it as a sensor or send data to it. Joysticks, remotes, and we are trying to make something that uh, really supports a lot of various protocols and interaction means. And if some of you know software like Max MSP or Pure Data, you know that it's a very common thing to use, for instance, using a serial port to control things or joystick, things like that. But the thing is, you will always have to use either different objects in Max, or sometimes if you are using, let's say, traditional sequencers, you'll have to use specific VSTs which support that kind of input or output. The choice we made in OSIA is to streamline everything behind a For instance, uh, let's see, well, here I don't have any input, but I'll show, um, or maybe I can plug a keyboard. Uh, no, I can't plug a keyboard, okay. So uh, just to show what this tree looks like, um, I'll move on to another score, uh, this one. So in this score, I have a small tree. Um, this is basically a key value map. So you have parameters, and these parameters have value. In this particular case, uh, this is not a musical score. This is a score that will control visuals. Uh, these visuals are made through processing. I'll just play it back once and, uh, so that you can see what kind of thing it can do. Uh, so let's make that bigger. It doesn't want to get bigger. OK. Uh, hope it's big enough. OK, if I play that, you'll see that colors will be changing and uh, that there are going to be some effects. So uh, hopefully, this isn't too laggy on the live show. Uh, I'll just play it a couple of times again and maybe a bit slower so that YouTube has the time to update. So hopefully, you shall see the gradient slowly changing, and uh, the radius of the ball inside evolving with the automation. And then when these little dots play, you should see a change of state. And all this is like simply OSC messages that are sent. So you say, for instance, this automation controls this kind of OSC parameter. Here, we want to send that queue to, to the network. And so yeah, this is basically this part of the software, but this is the communication with the outside world. And a last thing is, uh, so here we are only communicating with external software. It could even be on another computer. It could be hardware, whatever. But we also support uh, doing visuals directly within the software. Um, so if any of you know uh, shaders and things like that, you can write your own shaders in GLSL, play videos, and for instance, here I will have a LFO, which controls some kind of effect on a video. So like that. 
So yeah, so it can really be used for the whole breadth of media art, new media art, if you, if you know the, the artistic field, that kind of thing. And the only thing is that I'm mostly the only developer on that. So it's a lot of work for a single guy. So one of the reasons for doing this talk is if you are an open source developer, if you are interested, if that sounds like a project you want to contribute to, I can really spend a lot of time onboarding you and trying to uh, interest you in being a new contributor. So yeah, so this is it for the main feature of the software. And then we have all the plugins. So uh, the software, of course, support VST and also LV2 plugins on Linux. I'm a Linux user mostly, but also has its own plugin interface, which basically is needed to support the idea that um, plugins are not only um, instantaneous like a VST where you have your input, you have your output, but there is temporal behavior that you can have in plugins. For instance, the curves are plugins, the automation curves. Um, even the score itself is just a plugin and you can nest it like that. For instance, structure, scenario, you can drop and you can start building sub scores and nested scores within each other. You can zoom in a bit and start adding some curves like that, for instance. And then you can save that as a separate file, something, well, if you're used to this kind of software, it's pretty common features, but uh, yeah, you've got unlimited nesting. So you can go as deep as you want and then go back to the upper level and play back everything. Uh, you've got plugins for mappings. For instance, if you have an input that comes from a, sens from a sensor and an output that you want to send, let's say to uh, the color of some things, and you can create, for instance, something with a simple formula, math formula. So let's say you want to take the time and you want to write it to, to something such as, let's say, what is P1? Uh, I don't know what is this part, or I don't know what this is going to do. This is going to explode. Uh, P1, P1, P1. Okay, it's not doing anything. It must not be very visible. Let's try white instead. Okay. Oh, no, because I'm using mapping, so I must have an input. So I will be taking as input my ratio, which is computed by this curve, and output it mapped. Okay, and now it's changing things. Uh, it's changing the size of the stuff and it seems to be oscillating pretty quickly. So yeah, and um, another thing that is a bit different from usual data flow and patchers like Max and PD where you have uh, cables with inputs and outputs. Here you can also have cables like that, you just drag. But you can also set any address from this device explorer into, into as an input or an output of ports. And for all the programmers out there, you can also use regular expressions if you want to send a single message to a ton of different addresses, that kind of thing. So that is a quick overview of the software. Now I'm going to go back to the presentation. So um, this software was originally called iScore and it has, it started as research in the Bordeaux Laboratoire, uh, Bordeaux Computer Science Lab. And there has been something like 20 different rewrites over the year, mostly because of organizational reasons. The main issue is teachers have an idea, but teachers, their job is not to write software, their job is to have ideas. So what they do every year is they hire students to write software, except the students only stay for months and then leave. And this software basically, Every year, there will have been a, a student which would come for four months, and then the one until the next year, and then someone else for four months. So, of course, uh, this is not the same thing. So, the first version was written in TCLVK and C. There was a reimplementation in Lisp. There was another implementation in Qt in uh, 2006. So, that must have been Qt3. Another in Qt, another in Qt. Then so we tried another thing in Juice. Uh, then back to Qt, back to Qt, back to Qt, and uh, this was Qt4 until 2013, and then Qt5. 
and now we are looking at the Qt6 migration, which should not look too hard. So as a disclaimer, I am employed in a company that is pretty much involved in the Qt6 ecosystem, KDAB, but I am also leaving that company in one week to focus full time on OSEA. Um, so yeah, so this is basically the family tree of the software. I mean, the, there are in blue blueish. This is the actual software, and in yellowish, it's the libraries that the software are using. Um, there are yeah, a lot of research, a lot of people doing all sorts of stuff. And to give a feeling of what it is about, here are some pictures of art shows in which it was used. So uh, this is a partir from Tibo Magi. This is Alia. Um, the third one is quite funny. It's a vibrating table used for pseudo medicinal. Well, it's artistic medicine, let's say. So you put on yourself on the table, something vibrates at 10 or 20 hertz, and apparently those things. The first one is a fun installation which involves five mobile phones and people decide um, the evolution of the score with their mobile phones, small user interfaces we have to put on it. And, uh, and basically it's very interactive and open performance. It's Carrie from Pierre Couchard. Um, the fifth one is something that we have a lot of fun with. We control small robots and we write scores and choreographies for little robots called the Metabots, which are developed also in the computer science lab in Bordeaux. And um, we did a show with that last year with um, someone doing moves in front of a Kinect and the robots were supposed to imitate as well as they could the moves of the performer. And uh, so this picture with all these nice and very expensive Genelec loudspeakers is a dome. And uh, this is to illustrate that um, OSIA has no trouble with multi-channel audio. You can, well, the, the biggest one so far we did was 32 channels, I think, yeah, 32, uh, with sound specialization. So if you want to use Post, for instance, if you know Post, you can use Post directly inside score to, to use VBAP or DBAP. And uh, this last one is, uh, I'll show a video. This is a project that was done during my PhD. It's a uh, musical merry-go-round, so it's a normal merry-go-round, except that um, all the places where you sit are musical instruments. And during uh, the round, which lasts five minutes, uh, you play music, basically. So I will play a small video to show that. Um, so this is in French, but doesn't matter too much. Qui se joue dans un univers merveilleux sous une coque de miroir et de lumière. Dans un univers féerique, un voyage sensoriel débute. Les participants expérimentent les instruments, ils créent une œuvre collaborative. Harpe, accordéon, archer, boucle électro-acoustique, clavier, percussion. So about this uh, Jewish frame of question. Le basilic um, est une créature mythique du bestiaire. I will have a slide on this later, Fabian. Et fait le lien avec And uh, Eric, de yes, uh, they musical. are on the website. I'll give the link at the cage de ce basilic fantastique. Uh, Archie 3D, yes, uh, Sloan Standline also slows the audio. We use Rubber Band as a library. And oh, to, just for this small funny anecdote. Um, so this is my desktop computer here. And um, I had to code during the installation inside the mirror ground, which ruled um, they will do, of course, tests during the day. So uh, after the day ended, I, I still had the head spinning for like two hours afterwards. And all day spinning and coding, I don't think you want to experience. Um, we're just checking the various questions because I, I haven't put too much. Uh, Eric, uh, can you name some examples in live performance context? Um, no, well, I just did. <laughs> uh, slowing timeline, yes, that slows you do with the rubber band library. So there is, um, you know, traditional time stretch and uh, repeating uh, options. But the thing is, and this makes me very sad actually. So this is GPL and this means we will never be able to use uh, the plane elastic as an algorithm, which of course is very, 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 very good. Uh, so 
unless uh, one day the plane says, hey, we are making Elastic open source, it won't be as good as the um, professional um, offering. Um, mm, and yes, uh, this allows for lightning controls and the stage over. Uh, it can output ArtNet directly, but right now I'd still recommend using another, soft another software and just sending OSC to a, a software specialized in ArtNet and Genix because it's a very, very basic integration. Uh, yeah. And uh, yes, uh, so I think it's a third or fourth order for the embassy mix. I, I have to ask, I'm not sure, but we have a couple of, uh, actually we don't, we not, we, we sometimes use Ambisonix, but we also use various other algorithms depending on the performance. And we have we have built a system in the lab where you can choose between five or six different sound specialization algorithm. And Ambisonix doesn't always give the best results. So <laughs> personally, yeah, it's more often so people use VBAP or DBAP because it's kind of simpler and much less angry in resource. So yeah. And uh, to collaborate, the best way will be to come and say hi on the chat. And uh, um, so I'll talk about, a bit about it later. So there will be an official release starting from at the end of August. We're hoping for, um, we'll, we'll set up some kind of contribution guidelines by then. In particular, what is very lacking is a kind of user library where we will, you know, if you start a Ableton Live, for instance, you have all these presets of for all the default live plugins and there is nothing like that here. So this is something that is quite lacking to have just some simple presets that you can drag and drop. Uh, and else, if you know C++, you can also come and contribute and that would be super, super, super nice. There are like a lot of open bug reports in GitHub. Um, so yeah, so this is it for the kind of installations we are using. And a word to the sponsors. Uh, so, um, yeah, the French sponsors are the multiple research projects. Uh, we got a small grant from Mozilla and Open Collective back uh, in February. And uh, the very, very, very big thing for this project, so which is not officially on yet, but you are really privileged to know that, is that we got a mega grant from Unreal, which basically allows me to employ myself full time to open the project starting from basically at the end of the month. And of course, all the people who contributed code to the OSR project, um, thanks to them because, so I, I wrote a lot of code, but I mean, for instance, all the UI parts, um, all the UI design is a uh, person which is called Akane. There is a lot of specification work done by someone called Pascal. Um, a lot of different people contributed to our project and really, I will be so happy to see more faces and more diverse faces in that list of people. Uh, so I'll just re-detail a bit the specific features just so that it's clear for everyone. So the, the interactive figures basically uh, are these yellow T's, which allow to um, just how much time do I have left? I, I, am I at 20 minutes? Is that right? 20 minutes is what you'd like. Uh, no, I, I don't know how, how if I, where I am in my. Um... Yeah, I think I think we're good. Yeah, however, okay. however, however much time you you feel that you need. Okay, cool. Uh, so yeah, so this regards allow to receive external OSC messages, external media messages, and go to the next part of this call. Uh, conditions. So I only talked about it earlier. Allows to choose a part of this call. So it's really if you are a programmer, it's really programming language elements that we took, uh, that, that you write like if, while, things like that. And trans we transpose them into a visual syntax that is easier to use when you are a media artist and not a programmer. Uh, so with the basic core, I talked about it, is that uh, part where you have all these values that you can control um, by OSC, by MIDI, that kind of thing. You can also control the software itself through this. It is, everything is shown through OSC. And uh, a feature that I haven't really shown is uh, the idea of a graph-based timeline. So um, if you look at this score, it is really weird in the sense that it makes a loop, which goes like that and like that and like that and like that, and it will run forever. And uh, basically the data model is a kind of state machine. So you can have loops 
in your score, but not only loops on a single section, but loops across entire parts of the score. Arbitrary estimate talked about it. And another important thing, and I think differentiating feature is that there is a duality between the temporal aspect and the visual aspect. So um, the idea is that if you look at something like pure data or Max, and most of the people who wanted to make OCR score were users of Max to give the context. Uh, the main thing is um, that Max, if you know it, is an environment that doesn't have any notion of time. It's just a program that executes. And as soon as you want to have a kind of score, it becomes super, super hard. You know, there are better tools like Bach, things like that, but it's still not like having a proper timeline or sequencer. But if you have just timeline, it becomes super hard to compose effects um, in time. So for instance, I have this small score. Where is it? I have, yeah, example autograph. Uh, uh, uh. So in this score, um, to give an example of what is possible, we play a sound file. Uh, it will loop forever. So here you click on it and there is this little loop button. And its output is connected to two effects. First, a bit pressure. And next, an effect chain with uh, distortion and then reverberation. And what scores allows is to say, okay, for this part of the score, this effect will apply to the sound, and then this other effect will apply to the score uh, to, to the sound. And that's something that you write down in the score. And then, of course, you need to connect cables to say, okay, I am getting my sound from here at this point. And another thing is. Uh, you can have flying things like that. So I have a small curve that I will be able to figure whenever I want. So extremely similar to clips in Ableton or all these kind of things. And um, I'm sorry, it's pretty much harsh noise. So maybe uh, I'll try to be careful of this volume. Uh, do we hear anything? No, we don't. What's happening? Uh, hmm. So here we've got our pressure. And now we're into our synthetic chain. And now I can trigger my automation at any point. And I can re-trigger it. And I could do that from an external control and that kind of thing. So let me just check if there are any questions. Uh, uh, yeah, Epic are very, 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 very cool. They are also supporting a lot of other open source projects like Krita, like uh, Godot, which is a game engine. So super nice. And um, yeah, so shaders is what I showed there. So you can make visual, VFX, that kind of thing. And now I'm going to uh, talk a bit about um, the library that is used um, underscore, which is called Libosia. So it's a LGP library. So, and everything is um, available on GitHub. So here we have uh, the OSIA GitHub. Uh, okay, it's taking a bit of time to load. Okay, GitHub is slow. Um, so Libosia is basically the C++ library, which supports the execution engine, um, that kind of thing, which abstracts all these protocols used in creative coding, like OSC, MIDI, that kind of things, behind a single API, which is basically a tree, a very, very simple tree. And it has, oh, um, okay, wait. It has a preset system to say, okay, I want to load a preset for my OSC device uh, on another computer. And it has the whole execution engine. So we'll talk a bit about it later. So, and there are a lot of creative coding bindings of in Libos chat. That was the idea that we will have one library that you will be able to use from any environment you like, and everything will be compatible and communicate together. So if you know any of these names, then you can use Libos chat with this. And in terms of software development, uh, Libosia tries its best to match the host environment paradigm. Uh, what does that mean? That means that, for instance, um, I told that Libosia is based on the notion of tree. So if the host programming language like Max has a built-in notion of tree, like patches and sub-patches, 
then we try to leverage it to create things automatically and so that it is very it feels very native to the user so there is documentation lane uh, on github so yeah so this is the osia github so if you want to help and contribute this is the first place to go and uh, then yes we have the libosia documentation uh, which is on osia.github.io I'll, I'll send the link somewhere so that you can all have them maybe i can write it here so. Um, and we have all the, bin, all the features on the left and on the right, we have all the ways to use the, a given feature on, for instance, from Python, from uh, Qt, from Open Frameworks, from uh, Unity. Um, so yeah, and it's always the same features, but under APIs, which are adapted to the for instance, if you use Unity 3D, uh, then exposing a parameter to OCI is just adding a single attribute to your number. So that kind of thing. And there are two C++ APIs, and I won't delve too much on that, but to use the past one. Um, and another important thing in OCI is that uh, we teamed up with uh, various um, kind of consortium, which was led by Vidvox, who make VDMX and a few other software, to create a protocol on top of OSI. So OSC is a protocol like MIDI, but much more general, even through MIDI 2.0 um, gets a bit better in that regard. And so if you know OSC, you are likely going to like what you're already going to see next. So I show earlier this thing in processing. Uh, so processing is a Java environment for creative coding. And in it, we create an OSC query server. And we create a couple of parameters. Uh, we give them those sweet names. We say, OK, these are floats. Um, and then what happens? What happens is that you can go, for instance, to a um, web browser and go to uh, local host. Uh, and then you'll see everything as you And I'm going to use Firefox because Firefox is much better for that. Okay, and with Firefox, we can see um, all our parameters in real time. And basically, OSC query is a WebSocket, WebSocket protocol to introspect all the OSC parameters of an app. And um, so SCORE uses it to uh, basically detect the thing. So here you can just say, okay, add device, like OSC query. And uh, you will see everything that is on your network. It uses bonjour or zero conf, I don't know how you call that on your system. And you press add, and it detects all the parameters automatically. So you never have to type your parameters by hand. You don't have to do learning, that kind of thing. It just works if both software support OSC query, of course. So that was a very nice initiative. Um, thanks, it works for living this because it makes that kind of thing square easier. Um, so now we are going to talk a bit more about code. Uh, first, I'll start with the uh, data model, the architecture, and the, the arch arch architectural choices that uh, were here. So um, the UI is made with Qt, is super traditional, object-oriented programming, uh, command pattern, abstract factory. Uh, we use the observer pattern to Qt diagonal slot mechanism. And uh, one thing which uh, I am very much dubious of is uh, the model view presenter pattern. So we decided to use that back in 2014. And I was uh, very young and didn't have any clue on proper software development. Um, um, this is the only thing that I think is, in terms of um, development pattern, is a mistake. Um, it just makes everything more complicated. We only have one view 99% of the time. Uh, splitting the view and the presenter, it, it just adds so much boilerplate and so much allocations and shit for absolutely nothing. But otherwise, the traditional OP architecture works very well for plugin-based GUI apps, which really makes sense because if you look back at the 80s and 90s OP papers, it was what it was made for. Uh, a nice thing is that students can just come and be productive on the code every summer. Most parts of the code are very independent. But yeah, the only thing is there's lots of boilerplate. Um, I'll get back to why later. 
And so yeah, for feature contributors, um, the software is split in two parts. Uh, in source code, you have the lib part, which is independent of the domain of score. It's just widget utilities, that kind of things. And everything is implemented as a plugin. If you don't have all, like, all the parts of the software are separate plugins. And um, yeah, uh, the big thing in the software is not that much. We just have a few widget panels, that kind of thing. But in terms of C++, we are really, 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 really lacking reflection and back classes. And there is so much lost time due to lacking proper code generation features. And it's very frustrating. Um, so yeah, so now to speak a bit more of the actual data model, um, the general idea is that it is a tree of processes which mix themselves back into their parents. So here in uh, this simple example, you've got the automation uh, which is nested inside an interval with line. Interval is nested inside a scenario which is temporal organization which is nested into interval, blah, 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 blah up to the root level. And uh, the root level is the same kind of objects than every other. We try to make something that makes computer scientists happy with, um, let's say, very simple data model. And it's a bit similar to patches and sub patches in Max and PD, except that we are not file based. And then, uh, so we have this first tree, and then we have a kind of graph for the timeline. So, um, these are all the elements of the timeline, so I talked a bit about them. So the states are for sending a single message at a given point in time. Condition it's an if else. Trigger is to for event handling. Uh, time sync is to connect things vertically, and interval it's the uh, horizontal line that you so. And um, now, if you we really dig a bit deeper in the engine, so there are a lot of various approaches. So the very first approach didn't even have audio, and that's very interesting for music software. It was developed in a music lab, but the, up to three years ago, there wasn't any sound that we get out of it because all our user base were people who were doing more performance art, uh, theater, that kind of thing, and they didn't need to play the sound, or they would use another software when they needed to play a sound and send a message, OST message to it. That made me very angry because I am a musician and I want to do music. So it was frustrating to work on that as far and not have any kind of audio processing. And then at some point, we started looking at Lego to Stream, which is a library made in Gram. So if you know the first programming language, it's the same people. Um, the model matched well the first version of Score, but then we started adding features and it didn't match anymore. So um, we had to write our own stuff from scratch, um, story of my life. And so um, the very specific thing in terms of implementation of score is that it's a dynamic data flow graph. That is, the data flow nodes vary in time. Uh, there will be a nice schema afterwards. But depending on the point in which you are in the timeline, for instance, if you are at this point, you have one data flow. And if you are later at this other point, you have another data flow. So there is a lot of work in making this data flow switching process kind of efficient. And otherwise, the implementation itself is not very big. It must be like 10,000 lines of C++. It's really not that much. Uh, it uses Boost. It uses everything it can because, as I said, I was mostly alone doing the meat of the development work. So any library was good to use. Anything that will save me a couple hours of coding um, a very important uh, thing is that uh, we were also using TDB, which is a library for parallel graphs, and uh, recently migrated to CPP Task Flow, and that gave us a very, very, very neat 8% performance boost. And uh, it's also header only, if you know the pain of building C++, which just makes it so simple to use. Uh, another important thing is how do we make it so that you can edit the score while we play, and now we are full into C++, so we are using the library which is called Reader Writer from HTML. Very nice log-free queue, but I will let Timur talk about everything log-free because I think that is part of what his talk is about. Uh, but yeah, we just have queues of uh, exchanges messages between threads and some manual garbage collection. 
uh, for instance, to make sure that we don't have any kind of allocation on the, um, the allocation, especially the allocation in the audio frames. And so this is a quick schema of the um, audio architecture. Uh, up, uh, no, okay. Uh, um, so yeah, so to give a summary idea of how things work, so we have a data model in the UI thread and an execution model in the execution thread or threads, and they communicate with this chain of commands, and that is surprisingly extremely efficient, but never saw that drop up in any kind of uh, profiling bottleneck, so that was neat. And finally, the big question is visuals. And visuals is yet another graph. So um, to explain a bit how graphics work, um, when you are doing graphics in 2020, you are trying to use your GPU maximally because the GPU is super powerful. So you really want to uh, use it to its best. And so we have neat APIs such as Vulkan, Metal, GH3D. Um, and those APIs work by um, basically say, sending to the GPU a list of things to do. And how do we generate a list of things to do with the GPU? Well, a very common way is by a graph. That is, we have a graph of the things we want to do that the user positions in this software, as you saw. And then that gives us a list of commands sent to the GPU. And uh, it's another thread, so I'm starting to be a bit anxious with all these threads in the software, There's also video decoding threads, that kind of things. But so far, this hasn't caused too many problems. And we also tried to um, separate things a bit and be like more um, Unix, uh, let's say, uh, Unix C in the sense of having separate processes. But uh, for instance, playing back videos in uh, an external process that gave us a bit too much latency to our liking. So maybe these are like coding issues, but uh, yeah. Um, da, 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 da. If things are too blurry, or if my accent is <laughs> too French, I can repeat, or I can uh, talk a bit about. It. Yeah. No, it sounds sounds and looks great. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, all good. All right. And uh, so how does it work? So um, for visual, so we have our graph in the audio thread. And uh, when the visual node graphs, there are some shim nodes in for the visual graphs, they get a token and then they send it through the same message mechanism to the visual thread. And um, well, that just works. Um, so how does everything work together? So first I will show a schematic in big. So um, where is it? Um, where is it? No, where did I lose it? Okay, I, I lost a picture. Okay, I'll stay on that later. Um, okay, so this picture as left is very small, I'm sorry. Uh, it shows a, a simple uh, graph, a, a simple score with two parts. The first part, first part has an automation which loops. This automation goes inside a mapping, uh, which applies a kind of easing function. Um, and uh, the mapping is sent for an OSC message to uh, some external light intensity control. But uh, note that there is a small C at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to see if I can not just open that picture bigger because it's horrible for you guys. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, this one. OK, this should be there. OK, so we have uh, this automation, which goes inside the mapping. And both the automation and the mapping send an OSC message because the mapping may or may not be active depending on the condition. Then after a while, we play a sound. And at some point, we may send the output of the sound inside an effect. But we also want to play the sound if there is no effect. So what this means is that uh, we have actually a lot of various possible data flows in this score. A lot of different possibilities can happen. Things can be triggered or not. And these are all the graphs that are generated by software. There is the um, hierarchical graph. I talked a bit about it earlier. Um, 
the data flow graphs and uh, the temporal graph on the right, which is basically how things follow each other in time. And uh, when I did this slide, there wasn't visuals yet. So, <laughs> so the, but if there was visuals, there will be yet another graph just for what's then being sent to the GP. And if you're interested in the actual software architecture, uh, we have a, um, how do we say, UML model, which is not entirely up to date, but is still pretty much relevant. So it is in the Git repository, it is score.q model. And um, so, yeah, it's a good starting point if you want to understand how things are organized. So it is opened in the Qt creator. And I spent quite some time doing this and explaining all the, not here, all the relationships between different classes. So if you are lost at some point and you want to contribute, uh, this is a good place to see how everything, every class relates to each other because that's the drawback of OOP design. You get a lot of classes with very small responsibilities. So that makes a lot of names, it's the kingdom of nouns problem that some of you may know. Um, yeah. And uh, one last word on that, uh, synchronizations. Is, so uh, a common problem in audio processing is how do you synchronize, let's say, MIDI messages very precisely in your buffer with audio. So this isn't done. Uh, there is a lot of research on that, for instance, by Ross Bencina. So if one day a user asks us about that, then <laughs> I'll start looking into implementing it. But so far, no one has complained. So yeah. And uh, so uh, is uh, uh, uh. so to answer the thing. So I wrote, let's say, ninety percent of the code, um, but. There is a lot, 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 lot of research and there is a lot, lot, lot of people uh, involved. And uh, also I am quite lucky there hasn't been too many bugs so far, but I can guarantee that like, it's still buggy sometimes much more than uh, Ableton Live. So, um, so now I'm going to talk a bit very, how much time do I have left? I think <clears throat> just a couple more minutes maybe. Um, okay, so, okay, yeah. so I'll just, Skim very fast, and if we want to talk about it, yeah. it's just to to talk about some. The, a big choice here was to um, use C plus plus and follow modern C plus plus very very aggressively because uh, my very very naive young self idea was okay. If we use all of these fancy fancy pants new features, everything will work fine and will be fast. And um, um, so the language features, for instance, C plus plus said are C plus plus seventeen are super nice. If const expr, full expression, move semantics, which are from C11, um, auto is super nice because you just don't have the time to type types when you are doing a thesis. So, and uh, my experience with almost almost always auto is every programmer who started in projects was like, no, auto is shit. I don't want that shit. And after two months, everyone was like, auto is fantastic. So, <laughs> that is my own personal experience that. Um, everyone always get converted to auto when they are on actual project with a lot of stuff on it. Um, the language feature I'm looking for are those, but the one I want is breaking meta classes because like 20 to 25% of the code could just go if we had these code generation features. Um, and then there's library features and just a quick word, variant, bad, uh, a core, a very, very, very core data type in OSIA is a variant of integer, float, ball, string, blah, blah. It's everything that we send store in our message tree. And um, at some point, we were using X variant before the std variant back uh, this five years ago. And the debug size of the library was sometimes around one gigabyte. And the release, release build was around three megabytes. So there was like almost 90, 98 megabytes of debug symbols because of that. So I had to write a code generator to just generate switch cases uh, beforehand because, um, yeah. And I hope student variant will get better with time, but I'm not convinced. And uh, super sad to have a student optional without references because uh, it was used. So we are still on the boost optional, which supports references. Um, and yeah, I, I, I will skip that because there is not, not enough time. Uh, a big question that I know, and I, I hope I am not offending the sponsors. Juice is super fine, but uh, we uh, an older version of the score used to use Juice, and the performance was very subpar. 
uh, we need to do everything anyways and myself I need to better so I won't refute for writing it because just a question of time um, I think I'd still be using Qt today but mostly because it comes with a lot of uh, additional libraries like uh, for HTTP, WebSocket, uh, the trivia is super fast. There is QML for scripting that you can use in the software. So you can, well, I haven't talked about this, but you can add basically JavaScript code and uh, run it um, during this timeline. Uh, so yeah, so that's it. Um, but some things are quite bad in Qt, bug fixes are slow. I, I, my first bug report took Two years and a half to to be fixed and uh, be merged, so very terrible. Uh, I suppose don't talk about it. Uh, compilers. Um, during my PhD, I reported forty bugs on MSVC, uh, ten bugs on Binotils, and a few on GCC, and uh, just one or two on Clang. So now I just use Clang everywhere on Windows, on uh, and I never use MSVC again. I lost like two months of my PhD just working wrong with MSVC bugs. That was very very bad. Um, check, hit track, and hotspots. These are very, 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 very nice tools from KDAB. They are three super nice profilers for memory and from performance. And okay, I won't talk about that. It's too, oh, I, well, one last thing. Um, if you want to see modern C++ in action, so I know, Corentin, you will like that. Um, so there is a part of score which allows to write uh, kind of compile, so we want to write in develop plugins very fast. So uh, if we take the game plugin, basically we specify um, a data structure which gives us the inputs and the outputs. And then we have something that generates a function that, well, checks it at compile time with, uh, checks that it has the right inputs and outputs considering the specification given here. And if you are used to writing max or predictionals, you will never get a typing here or here. You, you will always get the right types and uh, never make a mistake. But the drawback of this is a file with a lot of um, commas and a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, code looks like this. So, but it, it's not that much code. It's like uh, 400 lines of code to parse this, uh, mostly using C++ 17. That was not possible before. Um, so yeah, uh, next step I want to talk about this. Uh, there is a roadmap on the website. So uh, important thing, website osia.io we are going to make it but uh, for now uh, yeah roadmap uh, blah, blah 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 so everything that we are going to do next and um, one last thing so thanks for listening uh, I hope I'm not too late um, as you all know we open source maintainers feed on github stars that is Tonight, I'm going to make myself a nice meal of GitHub stars. So please start the repo because that is my main <laughs> meal. And more seriously, uh, we have the chats and uh, you can come and say hi. And um, if you have bugs, whatever, try to be here most of the time when I'm not working. So, so yeah, so um, thanks everyone. So I'm going to check. Uh, oh, why not Q variant? Okay. Um, why not Q variant? Um, so one thing is uh, Qvariant may do some memory allocations if uh, the type is too big. And also Qvariant, um, I mean, it's nice if you are, oh, one thing very important is OSIA score uses Qt, but LibOSIA doesn't use Qt at all. It's just row C++ uh, 17, as there is uh, not a line of uh, Qt in it except for binding. Uh, I, I wish people would get paid for stars. And um, other than that, yeah, Q variant, um, well, it doesn't have the performance characteristic that we wanted for real time system. Well, there are no real time guarantees on Q variant, while a uh, stood variant of uh, int float, well, there is no magic that happens. And uh, in my implementation, there is just a switch case. So, so yeah, that's mostly why not Q variant. And also, there are often pretty bad bugs with Q variant. So, um, personally, it's a class I don't like too much. Well, Sometimes when you are doing UI work with Qt, it's the class to use. But if you are not doing UI work, but backend work, I will not use Qvariant. Uh, so yeah. Oh, how do we approach testing with us? So um, I actually have a fair amount of tests. And um, so because, yeah, we can have a look at some. Uh, so for instance, let's say for the execution engine, I have some uh, 
some small scores that are written in, in code. And I think I have some, no, I don't have them, but uh, yeah, for instance, and I, I make very cute um, ASCII, ASCII uh, schemas of the score I'm writing, and then I'm writing the score in code, and then I have all my, uh, if five uh, time units elapse, then uh, I, I am in this state, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, that's mostly that, and then testing individual things, but it's still super hard and it's really, so if you want to contribute by writing unit tests, you are the most welcome person in the world because that is a soul draining work. And uh, of course that helps like for all the engine work, I always start by writing the tests first when I do the feature because it saves so much bugs, it's incredible. But sometimes it's so hard and a lot of times the specification change when talking with artists. So we have to go for everything like dozens of time to rewrite the test and super frustrating. And um, yeah, one thing that is harder to test is um, the network communication because uh, for instance, on Travis CI, when you, you have timeouts and things like that, and uh, uh, sometimes tests just don't work and that's very frustrating. But uh, for instance, what we do is, um, let's see, OSI query core test. So yeah, so for instance, we can send colors and we check that we get a correct JSON on the other side. And we check that basically everything is in the state that it should be, but there is still a lot, 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 lot of work in that. And um, yeah, but right unit tests, unit tests are good. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Great. <laughs> so yeah, thanks everyone. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, Jean Miguel. Uh, wow, this is—I know that several people in the chat have talked about how their mind has just been blown with the size of this project, and uh, and how many contributors do you have on this project? So, so uh, what, what, how big is your team? Mm, so the very core team is. Uh, three, four people, depending on who you ask. So I uh, do most of the code. There is Akane who is doing a lot of graphics and is also uh, working on the website. So we're getting a super beautiful new website. It's not official yet, but it's so beautiful. I want to share it. Look at that. It's, it, it, it makes me cry. Um, we have Pascal who is an artist who has spent a lot of time uh, writing specifications for score according to his own artistic practice and how we want like it to see. Uh, there is Miriam, we, who is a researcher who had helped a lot on the formal model side of things because during my PhD I had to write that in a much more formal way. So mm -hmm. I had to write the model in OCaml, for instance, and she really helps a lot with that. Um, and then we have uh, Antoine who helps more with uh, writing uh, Libosia and Libosia bindings, for instance, for Pure Data and Max. And Thibaut who is doing uh, writing examples and uh, running workshops, teaching like uh, music school students how to use the software. So Amazing. Yeah. Ah. Do you mind uh, unsharing your screen? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I can do it from No, you, you can share my face or... <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to do it, right? Yeah. You have to Me, who I have oh, to do it. Oh, right, right. Yeah, right. yeah there we yeah. go. Great. So, yeah, thank you so much for this talk. This is an, a huge and impressive piece of work. So, yeah, I'm also one of those people whose mind is blown. Oh, wow. yeah. And, um, in addition to that, um, I really liked everything you said about modern C and uh, unit tests and writing tests first, and the fact that you use Catch for unit tests, which I also noticed. Um, so I used to use Qt test and I migrated to Catch, and Catch is really, really much yeah, better. It's, it's great. So, yeah, all of that stuff, total cool. agreement for me. Nice. Um, we have a few questions on the chat, but I think you actually answered quite a few as well. Yeah, so I tried to do I'm going to start seven. from the, the start, and, and if there's something you already answered and I missed it, then just let me know. So I apologize in advance. So there's one, um, uh, Stu is asking whether, um, obviously with this being a tool for live shows, whether um, it's also allows for lighting controls and other stage hardware. Uh, yeah, 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 so, so, so I, I quickly answer it, but yeah, you, you have a lot of protocols to, well, that, that's what people were doing first uh, when they were using so far. They were not doing music or audio, they were just 
um, controlling robots or things like that. So yeah. Cool. And then speaking of that, so you had quite a few of um, like performances that were made with this that you mentioned, and people were asking uh, whether um, you could like post maybe later on the chat, just post the names yeah, of them, and yeah. look them so, up because they seem to be like really in interested about them. So uh, there is a gallery page on the website. I will be writing that on the chat. Up. So yeah, so all the pictures I shown were taken from this, and most of the performance have linked to the actual things because it's yeah. very important to give credit to the artist. And oh, that is one very nice thing to contribute. If you ever make an artwork with the software, please send us like one picture, one name, something that we can show that it's being used in the real world. Because in the art domain, you really need validation by the peers. So please, <laughs> right. So um, here's another question from Fabian. I think that's really interesting because you said you tried um, Q, uh, Juice before and then you settled with Qt. So obviously, um, it went through quite a lot of like GUI frameworks. Yeah. And you settled with Qt for the reasons yeah. you named. Um, but if someone else would um, like um, start a new project on like a similar scope, which UI framework would you recommend? So. For what I want to do, well, Qt has a, a nice thing that it's pretty big and it's pretty well maintained. There's a lot of people backing it. Like there's, I think, three, four hundred at least contributor, recurring contributors to Qt. So it kind of feels safe in that way to, to use Qt. And I mean, I've worked in a company where we have Qt running on car dashboards. So if it crashes, people die. So that makes me safer to, to use it also for that kind of software. Then uh, Qt also comes with a fair amount of drawbacks. Uh, so some of you know, for instance, the meta object compiler. So I personally don't use it. I use a library which is called Verdigris, which allows to use just C++, no external compiler. Uh, and then there's the, I'm surprised no one asked that, but there's this, this Rust question. Rust is this new super nice programming language. Um, so there are a couple of things that are still missing for me in, um, in Rust, and namely a big UI framework like Qt. But if someday uh, Rust has something like Qt a bit, then it will make a lot of sense. What will not make sense, I think, are simple UI frameworks like your EMG or things like that, because um, we use a lot of very specific UI widgets. For instance, uh, the tree views performance was paramount. We have some artists who have uh, 15,000 parameters uh, who update in real time. And that was uh, an issue with, uh, I remember, uh, with Juice, uh, having thousands of parameters just all updating at um, high frequency that will put it on its knees and cute it's that like it's very fast. Um, so, yeah. All right. Um, so, Nico has a question about the uh, dome installation that you showed. Which oh, looks like an ambisonic system. Do you know which order? Yeah, I think I answered that one already. Oh, you answered that. Yeah. Sorry, that must I must have overheard that. <laughs> oh to 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 to, to Gasper Asman's question. Um, well what I've been working are the you know um, speed indicators. So <laughs> if that way if you don't see your speed, that can be super dangerous. <laughs> But yeah. All right. So I think I think you answered the um, the remaining questions. I might have overlooked one or two, but um, okay. Well, if there is anyone who hasn't had his question answered, can yeah. So I'll um, yeah type something now or be quiet. Okay. Yeah. So oh. I think I think it's a great time, Teamer, when, when we were just talking about the uh, viability of Rust for audio to uh, talk a little bit about what we have coming up next month, something pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, that's really exciting. So next month, actually, it's going to be always the second Tuesday of the month. So it's going to be Tuesday, the 11th of August. Uh, we have our first uh, themed evening. So I'm really excited about that. So we're going to, for the first time, have um, a meetup, which is around a common theme. And um, so obviously, today, we heard um, a lot about like C and C++. Um, and um, I'm going to talk more about C++ later tonight. But as we just said, um, there are obviously other more modern languages that are up and coming in audio. And Rust is definitely one of them. Um, 
So we're going to have a theme uh, evening next month about modern programming languages in the audio art industry. So we're going to look at not C and C++, but other newer, more modern languages and what we can do with them and how they can be used for audio and how people use them for audio and what exciting new stuff is going on there. So um, we're going to have um, two talks and one panel. So we're going to have one talk by Ian Hobson uh, about Rust who talked about Rust before a couple of years ago at ADC. He's going to give us a new talk and update about what's going on with Rust in audio these days. So we're really looking forward to that and where we are at Rust. Um, then we're going to have a talk about from uh, Francesco Camelli about Omni, which is a domain specific language um, for audio and DSP based on NIM. And NIM is another modern new upcoming um, language which people are starting to use for audio. And then we're going to have a panel about um, kind of newer modern programming languages in general and how they're used for audio and where the audio industry is kind of going with exploring new languages. Um, and so we're going to have four guests on that panel. Uh, we're going to have uh, Neil Burdock um, representing Rust. So the idea is every panelist represents another one of these languages. So we're going to have Neil Burdock for Rust. We're going to have Ruth John um, for JavaScript and Web Audio. Uh, we're going to have Anya Shabarovska um, for Python. And we're going to have Jules Stora for Soul. So um, yeah, that's going to be really exciting. I'm really looking forward to that. 11th of August, um, talk, we're going to talk about all these programming languages and um, all the new stuff that people are doing with them and where we're going and where the industry is going. And I'm really, really looking forward to that. So um, yeah. Um, um yeah. but yeah. we are actually not done for tonight yet we also have two more sessions coming up tonight um mm -hmm. and josh why don't you introduce the next speaker for tonight yeah so um so i'm going to introduce a person that uh doesn't even really need much of an introduction to many of you um his name is sean costello he is the creator of valhalla dsp Valhalla DSP is very no well known in the industry for its reverbs and delays and spatial audio plugins. And Sean has been kind enough to join us today. And so once again, I encourage you, uh, everybody that's listening in the chat to ask questions, make sure that you precede that with uh, question all in capitals. Uh, I'm not going to be talking from a very deep DSP perspective. So I encourage you if you have deeper DSP questions, um, of course, not too deep, but uh, reasonable. <laughs> but if you have uh, more specific technical questions, please feel free to ask and uh, we will uh, go be going through these questions a little bit later. Uh, so Sean, thank you for joining us uh, this evening, this afternoon for you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so uh, I guess we could maybe start just by talking a little bit about your journey in DSP and as a plugin developer. Uh, how did you get started? When did you get started? Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about your progression? Well, I started off doing computer audio probably back in 1983 when I had Atari 400. But I'm not going to say I did anything terribly impressive with that. I was playing around with the audio and I didn't do anything really revolutionary. I remember like on my college application, I talked about I had ideas for using computers for music. And that's probably about as far as it went at that point in time. It's like, what if computers were used for music? And then in college, I did study. They had a really good computer music program at the time, but it was also, it was rather intimidating. Like I remember my fresh, freshman year of college, I took a class from Julius Smith on the discrete Fourier transform. And like, I remember the, the classrooms, like the pre qualifications, you needed high school algebra and trig. <laughs> and I went into the class and it's like, why is everyone here like this old electrical engineering guy? I mean, like in the <laughs> late twenties, that was seemed old at the time. Uh -huh. I, I did not do well in that class. Mm. And so, but I did take various computer music classes in college. And then, I don't know, 90s, just worked, slacked, um, played a lot of guitar, was into the various music scenes. Then I got into like, into effects. I really got into fuzz pedals. And it's like, okay, I'm going to start building these. And then got into synthesizers. And there's limits as, you know, like back then, mid 90s, you could buy synthesizers pretty cheap. 
Hmm. But I was really interested in the technology. And then I found myself getting more interested in computer music again. So around 1998, I went to our local university, University of Washington, that had a computer music program. I was like, I'm not a student here, but I'd like to take this year-long computer music course and taught my way in and took that as a non-matriculated student. I hmm. really loved it. Um, my you know, wife and I moved down to the, the Bay Area at the end of 99. I started work at this place, Staccato Systems, which was an offshoot of Karma at Stanford, doing computer music stuff. And at the time, they actually were moving over to video game sounds. So when I interviewed there, they were doing various computer music things, physical models and virtual early virtual analog stuff. And by the time I got there, I ended up modeling car engines for video games for a year and a half. Wow. And then... Which was not quite what I signed up for, but there's mm-hmm. so many, like the people that I was working with were so smart. Mm-hmm. So I was just kind of asking, like I asked questions. I was thinking of myself as like this kind of naive asking questions. It's like, hey, gee, it's like, but I was 30. So it was probably a little bit embarrassing <laughs> asking questions like that. You know, it's like, having said that, I learned so much. Um, our company ended up being acquired by analog devices, which makes semiconductors, worked on DSP development for several years and then after uh, 2006 end of that we all got laid off i did consulting for um a few years the economy crashed 2008 and it's like well this would be a good time to create do my own plug-in company because mm. there was really no opportunities in seattle at that point yeah. <laughs> it's like either either form my own plug-in company or um, go into a different career. So my wife and I worked on this plug-in company together, Kristen, and just kind of worked, um, got a juice license, worked on code for a couple of years, put out our website, just hanging up our slate. And so started going live with our own plugins 2010 and have been going ever since. Nice. And of course, all of the plugins that I've seen from Valhalla have always been spatial uh, spatially related. Uh, is there a certain, uh, is there a reason that you've gravitated towards that side of things? Did you feel that there was something that was missing in the plugin market that you could provide there? Or, um, what was the reasoning behind that? I think my own neurology, Mm -hmm. I don't really know why. I mean, it's like, I don't even like, you know, I like some music with long reverbs, especially like more of the ambient stuff, but I also like music that has no reverb that's very dry. Mm -hmm. I think that it's, I'm probably less interested in reverb as a sonic thing in general than just reverb networks, algorithmic reverbs. It's kind of like playing some like mental puzzle. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's just this way is like, how can you take a very few building blocks and configure them together? Mm -hmm. And for some reason, just working with that, like working with those networks really presented a nice challenge to my brain and I was able to work with it. So I just keep coming up with these networks. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've invented several hundred reverb algorithms and most of them were not good, Mm -hmm. but I think it's just by trying these various things, configuring them together in different ways, I have come across things that are good. And then you learn from that and just keep building on it. So it's more just, um, It's less about, do I think that the world needs more reverb so much as I just, my brain likes to work on that sort of thing. Mm. And what, what in your opinion separates a good reverb from a bad reverb algorithmically? Well, that's changed over time. My definition of that. Originally it was something I was really looking at, you know, probably reading the literature. It's like, well, echo density is a big thing. You shouldn't have something that's too grainy. It should quickly build up echo density. But you can build up echo density really quickly and have it sound metallic. Mm-hmm. And so in some ways, that's related to modal density. And now I'm evolving to the point where it's like, it's not even modal density. It's the quality of the, you know, of the residences. Mm-hmm. And that's something that it took me a good 20 years probably to really be able to hear that characteristic. So I feel that now, now I can hear things differently than I did 20 years ago. Like what I thought sounded good. Like I have a reverb I did in 1999 that is made into some freeware. At the time, I thought that sounded good. Now I'm just like, oh god, mm. that's like it sounds real. It does not sound good to me. But, but it's also something that for me, realizing that subjectivity 
mm-hmm. is a really big part of it is that what sounds good to someone might not sound good to someone else. Mm. So, and that's been a big part of it. It's like, I think that for me, I've got standards of what I want the reverb to sound like, but I can't say of the algorithms, like, is this one the best reverb? Mm -hmm. For example, you know, like there's like something like shimmer, which is like a very simple algorithm. It's course, just a bunch of all pass delays in series. Mm -hmm. It has this very long decay, but has this really strange attack depending on what the all pass coefficients are set at. Mm -hmm. And that attack is either completely and long decay is either completely distracting or is really awesome depending on the source material. And it's really something that you have to be, it's not just a reverb that you put onto a source to make it sound better. You almost have to interact with the reverb while you're making the music. I see. But, but some other reverbs, you, you know, it's like, is it a goal? It's like, can you get a reverb that sounds good? on anything and that's like you know that's still something that i'm working towards is like can you get just a generically sounding this sounds good everywhere and in some you know sounds natural it's like you know the sort of thing is like that you know and honestly the closer you get to that goal the less your the the reverb is apparent if Mm -hmm. that that makes sense Mm -hmm. like the more naturalistic you get the less you're going to notice it as something so it's like a you know, a very lush, long, algorithmic, modulated reverb can be kind of like the star of the show, where it's like, but it's a lot maybe easier to do that than something that is really subtle and stays in the background. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And where where do you find your inspirations for reverbs from? Do you find it from analog gear and then trying to imitate that? Or do you, uh, you, is it more uh, a matter of playing algorithmically with the equations? How How do you find your inspirations for these? Well, I mean, it started off, I think, because I was working with C sound. So it's, I started off before I was like working on like trying to model a particular gear. I just tried out a bunch of stuff. I read every paper I could find on reverbs and some of them it took years to understand, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you start getting into more like what you call feedback delay networks and matrices and matrices, all that, all that sort of stuff. It gets really confusing, but I, I'd say like the first 10 years of working on this up till about 2010 was learning all these different topologies and reading all the literature. Mm -hmm. And since then it's been, how do you make these sound good? And it's also been like, you know, I have studied like, you know, get various, like not really analog reverb gear. I did some work with plate reverbs Mm -hmm. and that was cool, but that was like, um, but most of the reverbs have been digital and just listening to older digital reverbs and adjusting the parameters, trying to figure out, how they work, reading literature that probably maps to those. Because a, a lot of the commercial stuff hasn't really been published. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or if it was published, the person got in trouble for doing that. Or it's more like alluding to stuff that is actually, oh, if you trace it back, it's like, well, that person published this in 92, and he was working at this company in 87. And I know that what I've heard is that they reverse engineered this reverb back then. A lot of it is like, what companies reverse what it, what reverbs back in the eighties and Mm. like whether or not they published it. So there's, there's a lot of that, but then it's also realizing it's like, you know, and some of that is like the technology that you learn from that is like, Oh, this is really primitive. This, Mm. this, this is not good. And it's like, yes. And it may, but it still might sound better than a more advanced algorithm. Mm -hmm. Like something that's more, and it's just a matter of learning. It's like, why is that? Mm -hmm. And do you, You do you, Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, oh, no, you go. Uh, I was going to say, and do you find do you find conflict in that between a simple algorithm that maybe it sounds superior in your uh, subjectively to something that maybe is more impressive algorithmically, but maybe doesn't sound as good? Do you find do you find I've, a conflict I've, I've, in that? I've had problems with that. I think what it comes down to is that. Um, the, uh, the a goal is like hopefully the more that I work on this, the less my own ego and pride gets in the way. Mm. It's like, you know, if, if there's something that I think like, you know, this is really clever and the end user has no idea what's going on under the hood. They don't know whether it's clever or simple. They just know what it sounds like. And the end users can report, well, it, it sound this doesn't sound good or this sounds like, you know, and listening to you know, definitely like listening to other people's ears besides my own, getting feedback on that. And so 
it's just something that's like, you know, there's, there's the cleverness of the algorithm and then there's what sounds good. And, but, you know, hopefully I'm learning like, okay, if this sounds better, why does it sound better? And can I put it into some sort of analytic framework? So it's not just like, you know, slavishly recreating something from the past. It's like, you know, but sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes you need to sit there and really try your best to recreate something in order to understand it. It's like learning from someone else. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, and then it's like, how do you, like, what does that mean? And that can take years. Like, I think it's like some of the stuff that I did in Vintage Verb, it took me several years to understand how I think it works. And I'll never know if it's exactly how it works because people don't share this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like how I think it works. And then it's like, why does that sound different than what I did in Save All Hollow Room? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. why, you know, like which use much more like kind of more academic type technology. Yeah. So you were speaking earlier about literature and uh, we saw before the live stream started, we saw the extent of your of your library can you can you show uh can you show everybody your a quick shot of your of... yeah so this right here is like those are mostly that shelf right there is mostly like the dsp books mm. like the stuff on like what would be the left or like you know going from the top those are like these computer music books i dragged around with me for the last 20 years mm -hmm. or 20 plus years in some cases like there's one i got in 1988 then there's more just digital signal processing books and then uh, over to the right, there's more of like more of the analog stuff. I don't know if you can see, like I've got some service manuals. I don't think you can see it there. Yeah, but um, yeah, there's a fair amount of like service manuals I have from like uh, analog synths and electronotes and stuff like that. Like I've done a lot of study on more synthesizer stuff, even though I haven't really made any synthesizer plugins. So. Yeah. And that, but, but, but it's just an interest. And then over, you know, that I've got other various music books and stuff in here. So. Yeah. And do you, for, for the DSP books, do you have any recommendations that you could give people? What are, what are your favorites for, uh, for DSP? Well, those, those are changing. I actually, I should have grabbed one from the shelf. Hang on one sec. Well, so this is what I learned off the computer music. Uh -huh. It's good. It's dated. But one of the things that's interesting about data is like, it's still useful sounds like technology. I've got a book on computer music by Max Matthews from 1969 mm -hmm. and the algorithms in it are still useful. They're not state of the art, but they sound good. Mm -hmm. I'd say um, from my own personal reverb stuff, there's a chapter in this book mm -hmm. written by William Gardner. And that was really influential on, uh, it was the best survey that I had read about reverb development at the time. And that came, this came out like 1998. Wow. Um, modern books. I really like, I just got this one. Mm -hmm. This is by Will Perkle at uh, university of Miami. Yeah. And it's pretty great. The first edition of it was okay, yeah. but this is the second edition. I didn't know there was a second edition until a couple of weeks ago. And mm -hmm. it's great. Yeah. It's really good. It talks about like, and one of the things, he also has a book on um, designing software like this one, like about synths. Yep. And what's really cool about those books is that he explains some of this, like, what do you call it? Zero delay feedback filters, this new tech modeling technology for filters. Mm -hmm. And his explanations of it are a lot clearer than I think some of the other people that um, have you know done work in that field. And mm -hmm. like, you know, amazing pioneering work in the field but maybe not as comp comprehensible to people without a very extensive math background. Yeah. And the other book, I'm not going to go grab it from the shelf, but the uh, DA FX book by uh, edited by Udo Zolzer is um, great. That's just a very great book. And then all the DA FX papers are really useful. Yeah. And uh, what were you, are you planning on uh, continuing in the spatial realm for the future or do you do you do you ever tire of it or do you <laughs> do you feel uh do you feel that the deeper that you go the more that you are discovering and the more that you want to stay in this particular space all of that every <laughs> every one of those I, I mean like i've like for example like i was playing around during this time like after doing like i did this free plug in valhalla supermassive after that i started playing around like with uh phase shifting algorithms which mm -hmm. i love i love a classic swept phase shifter i've got a whole bunch of them here and it's cool to like learn the modeling of that and yet i don't know if that's like gonna be an actual valhalla pr product at some point because mm -hmm. it's just i don't know if it fits in 
but you know, I definitely see like I've, you know, like for example, if several years back I was working on Valhalla delay and I was really frustrated with the development at that point. Mm. Like, and I just did some work. Okay. I need to come up with a really transparent, clean sounding reverb. And I just started coding all these algorithms and just trying to evaluate them. It's just like, Nope, Nope. Doesn't sound good. Nope. Yes. No, no. Okay, let's go back to that. Yes. And so at some point, I, like there'll, there'll, there'll be like, a, you know, that work I'm going to want to bring out into a totally different plugin because it's very different than other stuff I've done before. So, nice. And uh, then, and I'm sure this, and then, but I would like to explore other effects. I mean, I love, you know, one of the things I have sitting around here, I have a huge amount of fuzz pedals. Mm -hmm. I don't know if those would be what form that be, but I just, I do love distortion and overdrive. Amazing. Valhalla Overdrive. I think that would be <laughs> really something. So let's let's talk about uh so one thing that I've noticed in your plugin uh aesthetic is that you prefer very simple UIs uh and that it would be very uh I, I think that'd be very easy for you to say that your reverbs are modeled after some old piece of gear and that you have some sort of 3D pseudo realistic skeuomorphic UI, but you've chosen to stay with a uh, very clean and very simplistic design. And I was wondering your, your thoughts on that. Well, part of that is like uh, Kristen, um, you know, the other person, like main person of Valhalla DSP, she really had a lot to do with that. Like I remember we were talking about the original stuff and I was trying to do like in the early days of working with juice, I was doing some like, uh, like film strip knobs and she was drawing a GUI mock-up and she did it with this very simple colors and then circles with lines on it for the knobs mm. and you know like very like using Futura and I was like that's it mm. I, I love that it's because it's just so it to me it like I really love I mean it's weird because it's like I know it's like my office looks more like you know some weird you know university library or hobbit house or something like that but I also really love very modern like flat graphic design. I love the Swiss school stuff. So there's just something about those GUIs that just really like that, those prototypes you did that really resonated. Mm. And so, I mean, and I think there's something that's like, I could say it's like, it's more honest because it's like, it's not really like a, it's not modeled, you know, cause it's like, even if I model gear, I'm going to be basing it like on, there's still my interpretation going to be in there. So it's really more about having something that, reflects where I'm at, but there's nothing particularly superior about flat GUI versus skeuomorphic. It's just all, I mean, it's like, it's what people resonate with. And in this case, it's like, like our aesthetics here in the company mm -hmm. really re resonate with these flat GUIs. So that's part of it. But, but I think we put a lot more work now into not necessarily the graphic part of it, but the user experience part of it, trying mm -hmm. to figure out like, like the biggest issue I had with Valhalla delay is like, how do you take all these different delays and model them and leave out as many controls as possible mm -hmm. and make it a simple to use tool? Like I always talk about, like I've got somewhere around here, I don't know where, but a Swiss army knife. And mm. it's like a Swiss army knife is an amazing tool. It's got, you know, it's got the knife, it's got the screwdriver, it's got the saw. And it's like, it can do all these things and it's not particularly great at any of them other than the knife part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it makes a lousy screwdriver. It's a horrible hammer. It's got a good toothpick. <laughs> but it's like, but the idea of like, how do you make something that's like, how do you design a tool that is simple to use? Because at, at some of these, like the more experience I got, like the more I worked with uh, customers realizing that a lot of the customers, especially as you get more to the pro audio space, they're the, the most valuable commodity that they have is time. Mm. And the more controls you give them, the more time they have to think about it. A lot of cases, people do not want to spend all the time thinking about it. So it's like, how do you minimize the user controls in such a way that it's like, it's still enough to give people what they want to do, but no more than that. And just kind of stay out of the way. Because I don't like... If you know, like early tool, like I did this plugin Valhalla Uber mod and it's based on a, uh, originally based on a dimension D, but then extended it to like stereo delay lines up to 32 taps, diffusion, different things. It became this really crazy, like modulation thing. And it, 
it's really cool. I love playing with it. It has like 40 parameters on it. The original Dimension D had four push buttons. Mm -hmm. And if you want a chorus, you just press one or two of those buttons, and that's the sound that you got. And realizing this, like, you know, try to do something that's somewhere, you know, like you can't really, like a plug-in with four buttons may not be enough. You want more versatility with that, but you don't necessarily want to have, like, or some people do want to have all the controls, but a lot of people really want something that's simpler so that they can work faster. So mm. it's like, how do you design something simpler? And the more I think about that is something that you kind of have to look at, at the, not just the user experience level, but going to the algorithmic level. Mm -hmm. Like for example, like, you know, the diffusion parameter that you see in a ton of reverbs is really there. It's like, how do you control the echo density? Mm -hmm. And it originally stems from the fact that you can, most reverbs have controlled echo density by controlling the coefficients of series all passes in front of the reverb. And by adjusting that coefficient, you ha can get an, a more dense reverb, but you also get a more metallic reverb. And so that's kind of a choice that you gave the user to decide whether you wanted something that was like dense and metallic mm -hmm. or sparse and kind of clacky, but more open. Mm -hmm. And when you get into a, a nice acoustic space, you don't have to make that decision. It's made for you. Mm -hmm. You have density in a good acoustic space and you have, you know, you have, and it doesn't sound metallic at all. So it's more about like, if you wanted to eliminate the diffusion control, you have to figure out how do you do diffusion that doesn't sound metallic. Mm -hmm. And that's still a goal that's like, you know, ongoing in my stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so hearing what you're saying it sounds like you prefer a plugin that maybe has a certain type of character over uh a plugin that tries to do everything all in one all in one uh plugin yes and that's and that as again is my preference it's like you know and just more like it's 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 not like saying that is how plugins have to be it's just you have to take a stance on stuff mm -hmm. i mean just like i mean not like you know, not like a moral stance, but it's like in, in order to do something, it's good if you strike a position. It's like we want to do more minimal plugins. We want to do plugins with more minimal interfaces. Not saying that it's the solution, just that this is a solution that we can stand behind and feel good about. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you when you say we, uh, I was I was surprised when you mentioned that there were other people in Valhalla uh, besides yourself. I was wondering if you could tell a little bit about your team uh, a little bit about the division of duties sure yeah so Kristen uh Kristen Costello she you know we've known each other for a long time <laughs> it's like uh but she is um her division of stuff is like she deals with more I guess like I guess I'm more sound and she is more vision hmm. and the vision deals with both the visual side of things like working on the plug-in designs and the colors you know the actual graphic user interfaces but the website like the uh you know, driving the development of that. And like, we've had web developer teams that have been working with us lately. So we hired that out. We worked with a firm belief agency in Seattle and then like cool blue web doing our, our web development. Mm. But that was like, Kristen was really in charge of those projects. She's been in charge of the web development, which is, I mean, a huge thing because that's, that's how stuff gets sold. So it's like the, the smoother that works, the more, the better it is for a customer experience. Mm -hmm. And and then, so that's, and then, and then it's also vision as far as like, what are the directions of the company? Cause there's always like, you know, I could sit there and obsessively work on things I'm interested in, but it's also, it's like, what are things that make more sense actually moving forward from a, you know, like a business decision and stuff like that. Sure. And then um, part-time we have Don Gunn, who's a local engineer and producer, and he does customer support. Hmm. And also helps with like, you know, driving new products and stuff like that. And we have him doing customer support because he works in DAWs and studios all the time. Mm. And I really don't. I'm, I came from more of a academic computer music environment. And yeah, I mean, I, 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 I always have Ableton Live fired up like mm. pretty much all day. But um but I'm not necessarily like as skilled as like very skilled at all in making music in pro tools and um, 
live and logic and all the other DAWs that are out there. Mm. And so Dawn is experienced in that, which is really useful when you've got someone that's like working on a movie and it's like, okay, we've got a, an issue with this plugin running on HDX system. Mm. It's like Dawn has an HDX system. So he's able to deal with those sort of like higher level questions that I would just be completely lost at. Mm. And, um, what was I going to ask? I just lost my train of thought. Oh yes. So your latest, so your latest plugin was actually free. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, the vision and how you get to a point where you say, okay, I've been working on this thing for X amount of time and now I'm going to give it out. Uh, what, what do you feel is the value proposition there? And, uh, can you just talk a little bit about what your vision is? Well, that the, the, the like the, the free plug in Valhalla Supermassive actually stemmed out of um, a couple of lectures that I gave. I haven't given too many like academic lectures, but I was invited to go up to the University of Victoria in Victoria, British Columbia hmm. to uh, to talk about reverbs. And they were working in uh, Max MSP there. Yeah. And so I learned for that Max for live. I hadn't worked with Max much. So. I create a whole bunch of kind of simple reverb um, algorithms and then just, and also, well, simpler ways of kind of showing how like delays in parallel versus delays in series sounded. And I had this knob to adjust the relative delay lengths of those. And there's a lot of neat effects that came out of that knob. And so I made this one plugin, I called it super massive, like a, a max for live thing. And it was, um, it sounded cool. I was like, this is great. It was not that complicated mm -hmm. for considering things. It's like it used like, you know, 16 delay lines. My reverbs use anywhere from 32 up to more than 80 delay lines in them. So, but it's like, but it's for that, but it used really long delay lines. Mm. And, that was, and so it's like, this is cool. And then, you know, I took the uh, ferry up to Victoria, BC, and it was really pretty up there. It was a really cool school. And I came back home and within a week, everything shut down. That's when the pandemic really kicked in here and it kicked mm. in kind of early and just realized like this, everything is going to shut down. And it's like, well, this would be a good time. Like I'm really enjoying this super massive idea, these concepts in there mm. and talked with Chris and, and Don. It's like, this would be a good free plugin which is interesting because i hadn't done a free reverb plugin before mm. but i looked at it as like well this is something it's like it's very cool it's also limited it's not really a good small room reverb but it does really big things it was able to explain like experiment with like how do i have i have 16 delay lines each mm. of them can be up to two seconds long what can i do with that yeah what are the various ways that i can make these things hook together so it's just like basically there's and that's where it's kind of like, I mean, I'd say it's like, it's creativity. It's like, well, it's like creativity if you have like 16 Legos and you can plug them together. It's like there's limited things that you can do, mm. but I, I get inspired by that. I got really inspired by like playing with the limitations and was really like, what, what sort of sounds can you do with this? And then, I mean, there's even a few things where it's like the density control on that came from, I put together a UI, a GUI, and it's like, well, there's a spot right here mm -hmm. that needs a knob and it's like well what about something that controls the echo density in a different way than the other stuff so nice. that's where the designing the user interface helped inform the algorithm but in the really base level of like oh i i, I need to put a knob there mm -hmm. amazing and uh of course with the recent wwdc we've seen that apple is now moving towards uh arm chips and that the line between what we see with uh, desktop computers, laptops, and what we have on mobile devices is starting to blur. And we've had that price differentiation between uh, what people will pay for an iOS app versus uh, something that you have on your desktop. And I'm wondering if you've had any thoughts or uh, direction moving forward in terms of do you think that that's going to be uh, what what sort of challenges do you think as an indie developer that's going to bring for you? And do you have any solutions or uh, proposed uh, approaches for uh, how to navigate that space? Well, in, you know, speaking of that, I'm definitely going to be developing for the new, you know, I, I always called it ARM Max, but now I guess the official term is Apple Silicon. Uh -huh. 
Like I, I, I've got the dev kit for that. I will be porting all the Valhalla plugins over to that. I'm for now. I'm going to be staying in the desktop space, and it's more because I think that when Apple started the mobile stuff, they they also started a tradition of having things priced at this five dollar price point, and yeah. I think that. Like, you know, and that's, and it's also, I think, a very different end user. I'm, my stuff is like, I, we have a survey. I know that about two thirds of the people that use the Valhalla plugins make some to all of their money from the plugins. Mm. So I definitely want to keep aimed towards that sort of computer project space. It mm. also seems like I've, I've talked with people like, you know, uh, Chris Randall from Audio Damage, like we're chatting constantly. Yeah. This is a lot of, he's a lot of fun. Yeah. And, um, so I, I, I get an idea of like this amount of work that's needed for the iOS space. And it's really, it's like jumping through Apple's hoops on that is, mm. prob- I mean, like probably more than I want to take on this time. It's like I spent the weekend, a lot of last week and yesterday dealing with some Apple hoops. It's like, you know, it's things that get surprising where it's like, oh, so this apparently changed yesterday or just because... I've had to set up a new machine. All of a sudden, my other machine stops working and it stops working because there's some new signing requirements that I didn't know before. Mm. And so it's like that stuff that you have to constantly be figuring out. I mean, it happens with Microsoft, but much more with Apple. Yeah. So it's just like keeping that going. It's like, you know, that's, you know, it's like learning that stuff. As, like on the desktop side, that's kind of enough for me to tackle at this point in time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just limited resources. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, as an indie developer, uh, we have a lot of people that come into the community that are looking to uh, become indie developers and see, look up to companies such as yours. What Do you have any sort of pieces of advice for people that are looking to get started uh, in a one-person or two-person shop uh, developing their own plugins? Um, I don't know if it's, is it okay to like plug one of your sponsors for the, for the show? Oh, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know how I would have been able to continue doing this work without juice. Mm. Ju- juice has been able like, so, I mean, I'm not saying that it's been completely smooth or completely flawless, but with the transitions going between like from, you know, 32-bit to 64-bit, and then moving over to the new ARM Max, uh, going from RTAS on Pro Tools to AAX, all these different changes. Um, The fact that the Juice framework has been kept up to date and keeps expanding to all these target areas has been invaluable. Mm -hmm. And and, and then it's like you can create a Juice plugin that then becomes all these formats. I mean, I forget about BST3, which I've done like internally, all the stuff's been proposed ported to VST3 for a while, but we need mm. to test stuff more because it's like, having said that, it's just like that juice just like makes these things targets. So you don't really need to learn the specific like uh, SDKs of all these people. Like, yeah. I mean, it used to be when I started off, I was really trying to learn the audio unit SDK and then that changed and it got the documentation got hidden, but yeah. juice it didn't really matter to them. It's like, well, you just click that audio unit box and it ports to audio units. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of amazing. I have done some, you know, it's like, if like the places where this can port, it can be really good. So my first advice would be learn juice. And then my other big advice is just give your, like, you know, I'd say like the books I recommended read as much as you can. Hmm. And then um, I'd say the approach, I really like give yourself something simple to start with. Hmm. I'm working with a student right now at UW, and it's like, okay, it's like, like for a juice plugin, try a state variable filter, hmm. you know, something that like sounds good, you know what it is, and then you can build on that. So sort of that stone soup of like something small, and you build on that iteratively, and then you can build up your own DSP li- library. Yeah. And the main, the final thing is just be, you know, be patient with yourself. This hmm. stuff can take a long time to learn. It can take a long time to understand. Mm-hmm. Um you've got, you know, it's like, give yourself time and like be kind of nice to yourself when stuff is frustrating because it's frustrating to everyone. Yeah. And that's, um, and that is the other thing too, is that it's like, it's amazing to me. It's like, you know, like there's so many plugin developer plugin companies. It seems like, well, this is like a saturated market. It's like, well, it really isn't. If you go into the, you know, like look at people's studio computers, 
it's not like they have one reverb and one delay. Mm. People keep accumulating stuff. For the most part, people don't get rid of that much stuff. And people use different tools for different reasons. The more that like, you know, like the more you get into the tools, the more you might experience, like appreciate the differences between the tools. Yeah. And it's a fairly friendly community. Yeah. I'm on, you know, it's like, I'm like on this uh, discord chat and it's like all these, all these developers are like really trying to help each other out. Like mm-hmm. when Apple throws a new wrench into the works, people are talking about how, here's how you do this. Cause it's mm-hmm. like, it'd be great. And that's why I love juice and like the friendliest communities. It'd be great. It's like for whatever level we have to compete, it'd be great if we could compete in the realm of ideas versus like being able, versus like who's able to keep up with the changing world and who isn't, it'd be great if it just like all that stuff was like, you know, it'd be nice if like software development with, for say Apple was as easy as it is to set up a new iPad. Yeah. If there's a wizard for that sort of stuff. So, Mm -hmm. but having said that, it's like, because there isn't that like other, other developers, you know, I found that have been helping each other out and I really appreciate that. It's a friendly space. I think it's a non zero sum place. Mm. It's not like if you're doing well, someone else is doing poorly. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I really like that. Yeah. Living in a world of abundance rather than scarcity. I like, I like that approach. Uh, I have a million more questions that I could ask, but I'm, I'm sure that people in the chat must be asked, must have a load of questions. Do we, um, do we have about, we have probably about 15, 20 minutes for some questions from the community. Uh, what do we have Timur? Yeah, we have quite a few questions. So, um, Taylor is asking whether you are prototyping your algorithms in C. Um, C++. C++. Yes. Yeah. And I, I like, I will say that it was interesting prototyping stuff in, I hadn't really worked with Max for live. That was cool. I enjoyed that. I think that was a really, like, I was able to get ideas prototyping there that I would not necessarily anywhere else. Having said that, once you get like large reverb networks start looking horrible in the visual space. Yeah. It's like if, if you do like in a visual design based language, it's just it's a sort of thing where it's like, you know, massive parallelism looks ends up looking like spaghetti wiring, you know, versus especially because I, I like at least as far as my understanding in Max MSP, I know they have this multi channel connections now, but I don't think that the things you connect the multiple channels to can be different. Mm-hmm. So versus like in C++, that's a for loop. Or a couple of for loops, yeah, nested. Right. Okay. So we have a couple of related questions. Um, so Peter's asking: um, a lot of the classic reverb algorithms are proprietary. Um, how did you go about learning what makes a good reverb? Well, I really think it's like reading every bit of literature out there, and it's like, and I really do think that it's a matter of like reading, coding, and like a lot of talking with other people about stuff. But the best way to really understand reverb algorithms is for me is to just code them all, code everything you can, learn something, code it, like tweak it out, come up with your own variations of it. And it is something about like learning, like the, you know, like getting the right um, academic source, which is like that, that Will Perkle book, like this book, the chapter in it is really great. Last I looked, this book was like 175 bucks, and it's like 22 years old. So I do think that this Will Perkle cha- chapter in here, he's updated it, and he's updated it with stuff that is like both newer and older, mm. if that makes sense. He like because he incorporated some of uh, Keith Barr's ideas. Keith Barr, um, rest in peace. He was the founder of MXR. And later on, the founder of Alesis. And then his last venture was founding this company, Spin Semiconductor, which makes this little tiny DSP, the FB1, which is used in all these stomp pedals now. And as a user programmable DSP, it's tiny. It's like, it seems primitive. It can do 128 instructions per sample. But if you work with the limitations of it, it can be very powerful for making reverbs. And the nice thing about Keith Barr's work is that he published a ton of useful information, like both like kind of just like 
gen general information with illustrations as well as source code on his website, which is spinsemiconductor.com. Mm. Right. So, and so, the, and the Will Perkle book now incorporates his own his own takes on that. So it's like, it's 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 really cool to see like you know that he's which is like both newer ideas for the Will Perkle book, but then ideas that go back. Like when I talked to Keith Barr, he figured out this stuff in the eighties by tweaking the controls on a Lexicon two twenty four. Yeah, I just kind of got the jerk idea. I like the Will Perkle book as well. It's like the new edition just came out, I think, last year. So it's like really, yeah. I have it on my shelf as well. I have to admit, I haven't gone through all of it yet, but it seems like a very good resource. Yeah, we've yeah, tried. So I, I was going to say we've tried a couple times to get Will Perkle on the uh, on on the uh, on the meetup. So Will, if you're watching this, we need we need you to come in and give a talk for us. Yeah, you have a lot of fans who are on here. <laughs> Speaking of publishing, Gashpur is asking whether you will ever you would ever consider publishing the best of your algorithms. Um, I don't know. I think it all comes down to, like, I, at some point I want to make the slides public that I did at um, University of Victoria, as well as like the the Max for Live patches. I wouldn't say that those were the best of my patches, but the ideas within them are what, like all the reverbs do. So it's kind of like simplified build from there. And part of me is like, there is something to be said about, I like some of the secrecy. Mm. It gives, it's, it's something, it's like, there's something that's a bit of a challenge about it. It's like, okay, this stuff is secret. And knowing that it's like, really it's different than the academia because mm. the academia is great, but there's something about the secrecy. It's like, I always thought of it as like, almost like a grimoire. It's like this kind of secret knowledge that you had to somehow deduce or acquire every now and then you might get like you know the john de toro published several reverb algorithms that are from this stuff and kind of like learning like you know like doing the tracing of like not only knowing that he published these things but then talking to people and like knowing like oh he did this at this company then there's something i really like about that so i probably won't be publishing the stuff that's in my uh plugins exactly but you know i can i can tell people it's like you know like spirit like half of them are like all pass loops and half of them are fdns with my own you know there's some things i've got advances on them but you know it's like that are not in the standard literature but a lot a lot of it is it's just a matter of like really finding the light right literature and i'd say that it's like literature wise it's like keith barr john de toro uh, Michael Gerzon wrote some papers in the early '70s that are still, like, like I'd say that Valhalla Supermassive was basically a tribute to those early papers. Mm. Right. Amazing. So, speaking about, um, well, someone said posthumously, I don't want to die for a while. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we have another question asking how much have modern reverberators deviated from the Schroeder design? Um, I'd say that the instant that you start having commercial reverberators, they deviate from the Schroeder design. Right. Which is something like that. Um, th and this is something that's like, I, I haven't really talked to too many of the old time reverb developers, but I know, for example, like the first commercial reverb was the EMT, com digital commercial reverb, was the EMT 250. And the second one, I think, well, maybe uh, it, it might be the case that the uh, Ursa Major space station was number two. But I think second or third was the Lexicon 224. And in the case of both the Lexicon and the EMT, the developers, uh, Greisinger for the Lexicon and Barry Blesser for the EMT, they both built hardware that allowed them to listen to the reverb algorithms in real time like you know it took you know i have to program compile it but then they could tweak knobs and i think that that made a huge difference in quality from the schroeder schroeder you have to remember was was doing time sharing on some giant ibm mainframe at bell labs so it would take like a couple of days possibly hours to days to compile his audio then he literally had to take the digital information on a tape and drive it 30 miles to where there is the only digital analog converter in the, you know, in, for the Bell Labs company. So, and then he was like, be able to put that on tape. So that's not really a quick iterative way of learning stuff. So Schroeder's stuff sounded amazing considering the limitations that he had. But as soon as 
in the 70s, when this real-time reverb hardware was developed, they tried the Schroeder algorithms and found them lacking. So they developed techniques like very, very Blesser developed modulated delay lines as a technique. And uh, uh, David Griesinger did modulated delay lines plus uh, all pass loops, nested all pass loops, stuff like that as a way of just getting the sound to sound better. So I think that was like Schroeder was abandoned very quickly for the most part. Now you will see some stuff like there's definitely like Yamaha. If you look at their patents, they had some very advanced variations on Schroeder type reverbs. And I think like some of those like Sony as well, you'd see these constant density reverbs that if you do a big enough Schroeder and it's well tuned, it's, it can sound good. I'd say that it's like an FDN that's well tuned would sound better than that. And I'd say that all pass loops for people just starting out this are far more forgiving as far as delay links and stuff like that. All right. So we have another question about reverbs. Um, so Justin is, um, is asking, uh, I'm currently developing a synth and adding effects. What would be a good starting point for adding a decent sounding reverb, which is not tinny and good with synth sound? Um, I'd say either look at like the night, you know, 1997 the Toro reverb, which so many people have implemented. I'd look at the spin semiconductor stuff, especially as like published by Will Perkle. And I'd also just look at, take a bunch of all pass delays in series, modulate each of those with its own thing. Um, and then like take the output from those, that all pass and then take a delay line and a filter and feedback that with the feedback coefficient. Like it turns out for synth stuff, just like what I call all pass loops or like, you know, or a bunch of all passes in series with feedback around it can sound really good for synthesizers. It's a simple structure. You can start experimenting with different ways of tuning the all pass delays. That's, so, that's really useful. Thank you very much. Um, I have one question which I find interesting actually. So Archie, um, so I'm, I mean, which I find especially interesting because um, I've looked into this stuff at some point. Um, so Archie3D is asking, what's your opinion on physical modeling uh, and convolution when you compare that to like algorithmic reverbs, which is what we were talking about before? That's an interesting question. As far as physical modeling, I think that they are limited by the resolution of the model. I mean, all depends if you're talking about like, I, I, I was very much like, I think that there's kind of, you know, like you talk about West Coast versus East Coast rap and synthesis. I think there's very much a, a West Coast US versus European physical modeling. And mm -hmm. I think that like the waveguide stuff, a lot of the waveguide stuff end up being for like algorithmic FDNs, it's good. Um, when you get to like, uh, but there's also the physical modeling where you have like uh, finite difference networks or, um, you know, whereas instead of having like 20 delay lines, you have several hundred million resonators or several tens of thousands of resonators. And that stuff can sound amazing. It's just not something that can be done in real time. Like, you know, like a, an actual concert hall, you would need to have several billion resonators to like, you know, second order resonators to model it correctly. And that's just not something we can do in real time. As far as convolution, I'm, convolution is weird in that I think that convolution theoretically should sound much better than it does. And I don't think that has anything to do with the concept of playing convolution reverb. Like, it's not about the playback. Like, the, you know, like I think the convolution engines, I mean, especially like with the zero latency stuff that came around starting in the 90s, I mean, it can be a very great technology. Now you can't get modulation, all that, whatever. It still can sound very good. I do think, though, that it's like a lot of convolution reverbs that I've heard have a strange sort of like almost like too much presence in the sound. It almost sounds resonant in a strange way. And I don't know. There's nothing necessarily about the technology itself that should do that as far as playback. I wonder if it has something to do with we have not yet figured out the ideal way of capturing a convolution impulse. And for example, I know that at Stanford, they did this project where someone went into the, the Hagia Sophia and like, like this giant sixth century building and, but it's a museum right now. It's not a music space. There's people in it and popped a balloon. Then they took the, the balloon pop and instead of using that as the impulse response, 
they looked at the energy and echo density in like 24 different frequency bands and resynthesized like with um, Gaussian noise of increasing density, like the, the echo response of that space. And it's, the results are gorgeous. It's like this beautiful, like very realistic sounding impulse response. And to me, that shows that convolution can sound really beautiful. I think it's more about how you, how you're generating the impulse responses for it. Right. So thanks. Yeah. That's really interesting about the Hagia Sophia. Um, actually, um, so we have like dozens more questions on the chat, <laughs> but it's like, we have another talk coming up. So I'm not sure. I think we need to stop at some point. Yeah. Maybe five more minutes. Okay. Think? Yeah. Like maybe two, maybe, maybe two more questions. Let's more go with two more, okay. two more questions. I was asking, when you released your first Truebird plugin, what was your expectation at the time as an independent plugin designer? Um, I was hoping that it would um, be a good advertisement for doing consulting. Hmm. Okay. And it quick, quickly became clear that, like, especially, okay, get this and another one of these out, and we might actually be able to make a living off of this. So. Hmm. Yeah, so um, it vastly exceeded my expectations, but it was also fairly low expectations. So, okay. right. so maybe the last question then. Um, so Mark is asking, um, can you comment on um, testing a reverb plugin? So, and they say it sounds difficult and non-automatable. Do you have any thoughts? I, I, well, since I'm not a computer science person, I don't think I'd even know how to automate it. It's it's really about testing it with various. Um, source material. So it's like, you know, I have like, you know, I, I have a very standard, like, what is it, live project I bring up. For dry vocals, I, I have a dry vocal. I There's a joke in the industry, we all use uh, Suzanne, Vena, Suzanne Vega's Tom's Diner acapella mix, which because it's like dry. And yeah. after you hear it for 20 years, you realize it's not entirely dry, but you have to listen to it for a good long time before you start hearing the reverb in it. Um, hmm. Drums, piano, I have um, guitars and synthesizers, but really, and then it's like send it to people and you just have to try it on a variety of different listening materials and see how it is. So it's not really an automated test. It's like, okay, imagine like, what is the use for this? And like, and for, for example, stuff like, you know, it also depends on the intended function. For example, Valhalla's super massive. I didn't really care how it sounded on drums. It's like, it is, it's free. It's it's a big, giant reverb. It's mostly designed using, like, I played the Moog Grandmother and the Prophet 6 a lot through it. It was All a right. synthesis reverb. So maybe you can ask one very last question, though, because there is one in the chat, which I find also really, really interesting, like at the very end. Um, whether um, there is another modern effects company that inspires you to go further, like in a similar way. So Peter is saying maybe in a similar way that the Beatles and the Beach Boys inspired each other. <laughs> um, I, I, I admire a lot of effects companies, but it's like for a lot of different ways. It's like you can admire them for the technology. You can admire them for the business model. You can admire them for their ethics. Like, for example, Sound Toys is done really good in business. There's no studio that you go into that doesn't have Echo Boy in it. And then they also did some really amazing donations during June. Mm. And they've done like, like fundraising before, like, you know, like, and I really admire that from like, I admire their business and I admire their personal or like, you know, their, you know, their, their political, like personal political stuff is, is really cool. I think that Fab Filter really shows what a, a flatter I can sound like where it's really or like, or can look like that's really visually gorgeous. Mm. As far as other reverb developers, I mean, there's a lot that I think are great. I definitely have a lot like Michael Carnes has worked with both Lexicon and then really with Exponential Audio. He did some, I really felt he set the bar for like what a plug-in reverb, how transparent it could be. I think that a lesser known company that I think is amazing, Liquid Sonics, he's done work in both Convolution, but his latest reverb is, I believe it's algorithmic. This is, I think it's called Cinematic Rooms and it's stunning. And this is a case where he's done work, he's on Seventh Heaven, where he did stuff based on both convolution of Bricasti and then kind of, and then he's done his own sort of Bricasti influenced stuff. And now he's doing just this pure algorithmic space. So I think he's a really brilliant developer. 
I think Martin Lin from Relab has done a great job with his stuff. Uh, I really, I mean, Fab Filter again, like their their Pro R reverb is really nicely transparent and a beautiful interface. I don't know. There's a lot of different people that I really admire in this space. It's, it's, it's not just like the old, like you know, David Griesinger, Christopher Moore, uh, Quantec, the, those companies. I I think those are great. But I, I see people doing really good work nowadays. And different work. Like it all fits in together, which is nice. Awesome. Well, um, we need to wrap things up for our last talk. Uh, so we have one more speaker. Thank you very much, Sean, for all of thank your you. input. Uh, people, are, people are really showing a lot of appreciation in the chat. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. That's yeah. great. Great. So uh, shall I introduce you, Timur? Um. I think it's fine. I'm yeah. Timur. I'm co-hosting this with Josh in case you haven't noticed yet and also write some C++ and audio code. Um, yeah. So, Great. yeah, and I'm going to actually for the first time give a talk on like virtually online. I've not done this before. So this is going to be um, interesting. Um, I've only done this like on an actual stage before. So let's see how it goes. What can possibly go wrong? So I guess I need to uh, share my screen. Let's see. Um, can you can you see my screen now? Yep, you're all good. Okay, so then I can get started. All right. So um, yeah, I'm going to be talking about using locks in real time audio processing and. That's a topic that um, ever since I started, um, you know, working professionally in the audio industry, which was in 2012, um, it just keeps coming up again and again um, in discussions with experts and programmers and um, people are saying different things. And, uh, you know, first I started really just learning the basics and then I started asking questions and then I noticed that some experts didn't really know how to answer them and then they answered them in contradictory ways. And I was like, uh, but like, can we now actually do this or that? Or can we not do this or that? And I got like very different answers. And whenever this happens with a particular topic in audio, this I know then, okay, you know, this is probably a good time to like um, make a talk about this because it means I actually need, really need to have to sit down and figure it out on my own. And so this is what happened here. Um, so we're gonna talk about locks um, in an audio application. Um, so, um, and this is, by the way, this is based on a blog post that I wrote um, uh, recently, uh, which some of you might have, might have read. I have uh, some uh, new data, um, which is not in a blog post. Um, but yeah, so let's get started. So locks, obviously you need them when you have threads. So as we uh, heard previously also by, from uh, Jean-Michel in his talk, uh, if you have like a complex application, you have lots of threads going on. So um, if you're doing audio, you always have an audio thread. Um, that's the thing that makes sound. So you have this quartz crystal in the sound card, which is giving you a timer. And then you, know, you have uh, your process callback, which is going to get called in regular intervals, something between one and 10 milliseconds. If you have like you know, typically 44 kilohertz or in like 128 um, sample buffer, then you're gonna have like three milliseconds between the process callbacks. And that's like a real time callback, which means, you know, you can't miss one basically. Um, otherwise you're gonna get a glitch. So that's the thing that you have going on. Then typically you have a UI thread or a main thread, which is going to be um, responsible for the GUI. So, you know, simple example, you have a volume knob or something like that. And then, you know, the user might turn the knob that's going to be picked up by the UI thread and it's gonna change the value. The audio thread has to pick up that value somehow. It also goes the other way around. The audio thread might get like an automation value from the host. So that needs to then uh, go back into the UI thread because that needs to repaint the knob with a new position. So you have some, some stuff going on there. Um, then you might have a MIDI thread where the user is playing a keyboard and making music and you have MIDI events which are going to be coming into the audio thread. You might have a file IO thread or maybe a network IO thread which is going to read um, maybe a wave file or like some other sound, uh, which then the process callback needs to play back and you need to get that into the audio thread as well. So um, how do you synchronize all these threads? And um, obviously, you know, if you just go like the computer science way, there's a bunch of ways to synchronize threads. Um, 
But if you look at the red arrows, uh, which are going into and out of the audio thread, we have this additional constraint that it's a real-time thread. So there's just a lot of stuff you can't do. Specifically, you can't block. So um, how do you do this instead? And there's like a bunch of methods, and I talked about them in previous talks. So I um, just briefly kind of like one is obviously using atomic variables. So if you have a volume, you can use an atomic float. If you have something else, you might use an atomic int or whatever. Uh, so that's really easy because you can get and set them. Uh, there's not going to be a race condition there. It works across threads. It's automatically synchronized. So that's perfect for something like the volume knob. Um, the other method is you have a log free queue, which is perfect for things like streams of events that are coming in um, to the audio thread, like MIDI messages. So you're just going to push your MIDI messages into the log free queue and then pop them on, on the audio thread. Um, so those are very popular methods. And I had talks about both of them. Um, in the past, so I'm not going to talk about that. But what happens if you have something that doesn't fit either of these scenarios? Um, and then normally you would reach for a lock, but obviously on the audio thread, you can't do that. So you would have, for example, if you do C++, you have a std mutex, for example, uh, or one of the other mutex types, and then you would um, lock it either directly or with like scope lock, which is like an RII way of doing it, which is nicer. But you can't do that on your audio thread because first of all, locking uh, a mutex is a system call, which is not real time safe. Um, and then once you acquire, uh, so if you can't acquire the lock, you're going to be waiting for another thread, uh, which is again, not real time safe because it's some code somewhere else. You have no idea how long that's going to take. Um, so you're waiting for something which is going to take a non-deterministic amount of time. So you can't do that. And then on top of that, you also get priority inversion because you're waiting for a thread which has lower priority than the real time thread. So yeah, because of all these problems, um, you know, the basically the probability that you're going to have an audio glitch is going to be above zero, and that's not good. So you can't do that. Um, so yeah, that has been covered before. Um, but like the question is now, what do you do instead? So what happens if you have not a float, not a, a stream, but something like a data structure, like for example, a vector of floats or objects or um, a linked list or maybe a graph? And uh, you have this whole structure, and then you need to, for example, write into that structure from one thread and then read from that structure from the audio thread, because you just need those numbers or objects or whatever it is for your processing. So what do you do then? How do you synchronize this without taking a mutex, without locking a mutex? And so I think the proper answer to this is immutable data structures, uh, where basically you say you're just not going to modify this structure from one thread and then read it from another thread. But instead, you're going to um, create a copy of the data structure, which contains the change you want to make. And then the audio thread is only seeing the old version or the new version, but you're not modifying anything, right? So you're just like making a copy. And then under the hood, you're going to be uh, swapping a pointer atomically. And then next time around, the audio thread is just going to see the new vector or list or, or graph instead of the old one. And um, so I think that's the proper way of doing it. And Juan de Bolivar has a bunch of talks about this topic. So um, I'm not the expert here. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and if you like, there's also other kind of related strategies around like object sharing and pointer swapping and other things. And for this, I can recommend the talk by Fabian and Dave uh, from ABC last year. And they go about like a bunch of techniques how to do this. Um, so highly recommend it as well. But Today, we're going to talk about the situation where, well, maybe you can't just rewrite your whole your audio thing to do these things. Like, for example, what happens if you have an audio graph? Maybe you're working with um, a legacy code base, right? Where the audio graph and the audio engine, that's just the way it works. And it just happens to be not an immutable data structure. And there's a lock around it. So how do you, how do, you do this safely? Um, where, like, yeah, you, you just need to um, somehow work with the fact that you do have a a data structure that's going to be accessed by both the audio thread and also another thread. And um, yeah, so we're going to talk about how to do that. But um, so what I did, um, for example, in the code base that I'm currently working with is I actually looked in there. And there were quite a bunch of locks there that people have put there. And um, just looking at uh, where they are, what are these use cases? And it turns out, I'm just going to give you a few examples of where I saw these locks occurring um, on the audio thread in practice. Things like 
the audio thread is for maybe you have a sampler, right? So you're playing a note and then you want to play back a sample. So you have a list of these possible samples that could play, maybe mapped to the notes, um, like MIDI message, MIDI note numbers or whatever. And then the audio thread is like looking through this list to figure out which, which sample to play. And then at the same time, another thread might add more samples to this list. Uh, another example is you have a polyphonic synthesizer and you have a, a vector of voices maybe that the audio thread can use. So it's going to like look through this vector of voices to find one that it can use uh, for a new note. And then the other thread might allocate more voices because the user has clicked on a button that you know increases the polyphony or whatever. And then you again, you have in a situation where you have uh, a data structure that's being manipulated from one thread and then read from the other thread, which is the audio thread. And you, again, you have this problem, how do you synchronize this? And then the worst case is if uh, you have to synchronize basically the whole audio graph. Like let's say you have a big audio graph structure which describes your whole audio graph and your audio thread is basically processing this whole thing and that's your whole plugin. But then the other thread is rebuilding the, the whole graph because, or inserting notes into the graph because something happened. Um, and that's like the worst case. Like, how do you how do you synchronize that? Um, so we already said you can't use std mutex like this. You can't you, you can do lock on on a GUI thread, but you cannot do this on the audio thread. So what alternatives are there? And so one thing that I saw um, in production code, people did, um, and I actually did uh, myself because I didn't know better. Um, is this, where you say, okay, well, we can't lock a mutex but on the audio thread, but we can try to lock it. We can do this try lock here. Um, so um, either you can do directly mutex uh, try lock, but then you don't get RII, so you have this RII wrapper, the unique lock, which is like a more flexible version of the scope lock, and you can say try lock. And the idea here is that, um, well, you're not going to wait for another thread to release the, the mutex um, because you're on the audio thread, you can't block. So what you're going to do is you're going to try to acquire the mutex. And if you get it, because no one, no other thread is doing anything with that um, thing, then you can do your processing. But if you fail to acquire the lock, then um, that's going to fail. It's not going to wait for anything. And then you have to use a fallback strategy, something like, oh, well, I can't access that data structure now. So I'm going to just you know, use the, if it's parameter values, I'm going to use the ones from the previous callback, which is okay. Or if it's like an audio file that I can't play right now, okay, I'm going to try to play it the next time around. Or maybe, uh, okay, I don't know what to do now, I'm going to fade out. Or I'm going to like, you know, something like that, like a fallback strategy, which is, depending on the use case, it might be okay, or it might be not entirely what the user wants, but in any case, it's going to be better than an audio glitch. So it sounds like, um, yeah, this might work. Um, people do this. Or is it? Is it actually OK to do that? Now, that's an interesting question. And to answer that, we need to figure out what try lock will actually do, or this like unique lock try to lock. So unique lock try to lock, as I said, it's just an RI wrapper. So what it's going to do is it's going to call mutex try lock under the hood. Is it fine to call mutex try lock on the audio thread? Hmm. Well, so if I don't know that, then usually what I do is I look into the C++ standard because I really like the C++ standard, as some of you might know. The C++ standard says about try lock, well, it's going to uh, attempt to obtain the mutex. And if, if that fails, then there is no effect and try lock immediately returns. OK, so that sounds pretty real time safe. OK, there's no waiting, there's no blocking, there's no system call. It's just going to immediately return if it fails. So you're going to get what you want. Um, and that is fine. Yes, except this is not the only thing that is going to happen in this code that's on the screen. There is another call which is going to be made, which is going to be called when we reach this closing brace here. And let's see if I can uh, maybe ask the people on the call, maybe, because I, I would like to ask the audience, but you're all in the YouTube chat, so I don't know how to reach you. Um, do you know what's going to happen here? OK. So if you um, 
you, so you managed to acquire the lot, you've done your audio processing, then you hit this closing brace. Um, now, if there is no other thread waiting for the mutex, then you're fine, nothing happens. If there is another thread waiting for the mutex, so basically this is going to call mutex unlock. And if there's another thread waiting for the mutex, then that mutex unlock is going to have to wake up that waiting thread, right? So you have another thread which is, might be waiting on the mutex. If so, mutex unlock is going to actually wake up that thread, which is a system call, okay? So that is not real time safe. And this is interesting because when I published this on my blog, there was um, a bit of a discussion um, where a Linux kernel expert said, well, but so on Linux this is implemented with a few texts, so you're gonna have like a few text wait call, which is, which is kind of fine. Um, it's not gonna do any work. Um, but then actually Fabian answered, um, well, but actually it might do. And actually here's like a link to a research paper which says, which says it's not real time safe. So it's funny, um, apparently on Linux, um, people like the experts don't really agree whether it's real time safe or not. Um, but actually it doesn't even matter because you also have, you know, this is cross platform code and we also have Mac and Windows and on Mac and Windows, you don't, you can't look at the source code of the kernel. I have no idea what's going on there. It's just a system call. So, you know, by default, it's just not real time safe. And so even if it's real time safe on Linux, which I don't think it is, um, basically you can't count on that being real time safe on, on every platform you care about. So, you know, the standard advice is just as always, if it's a system call, it's not real time safe. It's going to be non-deterministic. You're gonna, in any case, you know, have to switch from user mode to kernel mode. Um, that's a context switch. And then it's, you're gonna have like, the kernel's gonna do some stuff and you don't know what. So um, basically you can't do try lock on the audio thread. This is just not a thing that is safe to do. Okay, so this is not real time safe. Don't do that. All right, so, but we still have the problem that we have a data structure that we want to access. And um, you want to access it concurrently and we need to synchronize the threads. So what are we going to do instead of the mutex try long? And another technique which is um, well known is using a spin lock. So a spin lock is um, actually real time safe. Um, here's a simple uh, implementation of a spin lock. Um, so it has basically, whenever you implement any kind of mutex, if you're using the standard library interface, you're going to always have to implement these three functions. First one is lock. Um, and so for the spin lock, um, it's going to just try to lock the atomic flag, um, which uh, flags whether it's taken or not taken. and Every time it fails, it's just going to try again. So it's going to have this like infinite loop of like just trying to lock it. Then you have the try lock, which is just trying to um, um, basically set the flag once. And if that fails because another thread has set the flag, it's just going to immediately return false. So that's easy. That's real time safe, just like before. Um, but then the difference is the unlock. So the unlock. Um, now that doesn't contain a system call, unlike with the mutex, but it's just clearing that atomic flag, right? So um, that now is also uh, real-time safe. So now with the spin lock, we have a situation where both the trial lock and the unlock are actually safe to call on the audio thread. So you can actually can use this lock, um, the lock function, which is going to do the, the busy waiting. Um, and um, actually Juice also has uh, a spin lock implementation. So for those of you who have used Juice, so use Juice, there is one there. I don't, to be honest, particularly like the juice implementation because A, it doesn't use the proper uh, memory ordering flags, acquired release, so it's not quite optimal um, in terms of performance. And it also doesn't use lock, try lock, and unlock. It has like different names for these things, like enter and exit. So it can use with you can you can work with the juice thing, but it means you can't use it with the STL facilities, the C stuff like um, scope lock and unique lock and all those things. They're not gonna work. Um, but yeah, so then you're going to have to roll your own um, because the standard library does not contain a spin lock. Um, but yeah, so that's really simple to do. This this is going to work. This is, this is a spin lock. So that's going to be real time safe, right? There's no system calls anywhere. Um, and try lock and unlock are not waiting or blocking or anything like that. 
Um, so that works. You can use it, right? That's that's safe. Oh, actually, another question, another thing I wanted to say here is that um, I got a comment um, on the blog post that actually um, test and set is not optimal. So um, you would have to do a test and test and set, which is better because test and set, every time you do that, it invalidates a cache line. So the problem here is that you can't really do test and test and set with an atomic flag because the atomic flag does not allow you to test it without setting it because that's like the primitive. Um, so if you want to do the more optimal test and test and set, you would have to do like an atomic bool or something like that. And then uh, you have to check that it's actually lock free, which it always will be, but just put a static assert there. And then everything becomes like a bit more complicated, but you can, you can do that and it's probably going to be more optimal. So it's left as an exercise to, to the reader. Um, but anyway, like whichever way you do this, like some variation on, on this technique, um, it's going to be real time safe. So you can use that in the audio thread. Is it a good idea though? Is that is that a good way of doing things? Like so it's it's you're not gonna cause glitches, so that's good. But is this really a good way of solving the problem? So let's look at the log again. So that's the thing that you're gonna be calling from the um from the other thread, from the GUI thread. What is this doing? So it's going to try to test and set the flag. Uh, basically in an infinite loop, right? So if the audio thread um, has the lock, it's going to just try again, try again, try again, try again. It's going to keep pounding this atomic flag. Um, on my machine, it's like 200 million times a second. I actually measured, that's quite a lot. Um, so uh, it's going to completely max out that CPU core on which it is in, right? So that's extremely energy inefficient to do that. It actually gets so if, if it's something that you do like once in a while, like whenever the user you know clicks a button somewhere, which they're gonna do very occasionally, it's fine probably. But like the worst case scenario is basically that you have an audio thread which is like really busy doing some heavy processing, um, and then like you're at ninety percent CPU load because maybe you have like some really beautiful but really expensive re reverb algorithm going on. So 90% of one core is going to be um, basically the audio thread, like computing, computing. And then um, the other core is going to be also like 90% like or 100% because the other thread is going to be just keep pounding this atomic flag all the time. So you're going to have two cores basically maxed out. Um, that's going to suck your battery dry really, really quickly. So that's not a very good idea. So we can't really do this either, except you know, in certain circumstances, we're using it like rarely and briefly, and it doesn't matter. Um, what are we going to do instead? And this is the point where I ran kind of into a, a dead end because none of the experts around me in the audience really, really had an answer to that question that like I found satisfying. Um, so yeah, I was like, okay, how do we actually solve this problem? Like, none of the code I'm looking at seems to be doing it, like, seems to really have found like a proper solution. And whenever I encounter dead ends like this, I usually um, look outside of the audio industry, right? So audio industry, obviously, you know, we do C++, we do low latency, but there's a bunch of other audio industries doing similar stuff. We have the finance, like the trading people, we have the games people, we have the um, you know, graphics people, and they're all doing kind of related things. So maybe they have found some solutions to this. So you know, I did some research and um, I remembered that Bryce, um, Bryce Delbach, um, who works at NVIDIA, did this talk um, last year. Um, so there's a CPP conversion of this talk um, uh, from CPPCon last year. Um, I actually watched uh, also the C++ Russia version, which he gave like a month later, which I think is actually the better version of this talk. So I recommend you watch that. Um, so that's a brilliant talk. Um, so Bryce um, is on the C++ committee. Um, that's where I know him from. And he was giving this talk about the new um, synchronization facilities and the new C++ 20 standard. So things like barriers and latches and um, other very useful utilities. So it's an amazing talk. I recommend you watch it. Spoiler alert, none of the things in this library are real-time safe. So you cannot really use any of them on the audio thread, but it's a really interesting talk to um, 
is kind of going to get these concepts about like different synchronization primitives. Um, but the more interesting thing is that uh, in his talk, uh, Bryce introduced, um, well, not introduced, but talked about a concept which I presume has been well known for some time, but I haven't known about it personally. So I've discovered it only at Bryce's talk, which is basically the way to deal with this problem or the way, you know, graphics people and finance people and Linux kernel people deal with this problem, which is exponential backoff. Right, so that's the strategy that, that you need here. And um, Bryce was um, showing um, a particular spin lock Im implementation in his talk, which is using the exponential backoff strategy. And the code in his slide um, was this. So this is Linux code. This looks scary. Um, actually turns out that the try lock and the unlock and the atomic flag is exactly what I showed before. So the only real difference is in the lock function. So let's take a closer look just at the lock function. Okay, still looks pretty scary. This is obviously like Linux specific code, but let's try to kind of understand what's going on. here. So um, we have these like different stages of the exponential backoff. So we have like in the uh, previous example, we have this like loop, um, which is like, un unless you like, it succeeds to get the lock. Uh, so there's like a try lock. If, as long as it fails, it just keeps going. So you, you still have this like same kind of infinite loop. But in there, you have like four different things. So the first thing we're going to try is we're going to try a couple of times to just basically spin on it and just like try to get the lock quickly. But then if that fails, um, you know, four times, then probably we're going to have to wait for a bit longer. So we're going to. Um, kind of stop burning this energy in this infinite loop. And instead, we're going to go to the next stage, which is this um, scary looking ASM volatile, the, the inline assembly instruction, uh, which is this rep not instruction, which is like an Intel specific thing. But what it actually is, it's a CPU pause instruction. Um, so what this does is it's going to just put the CPU to sleep for just a few cycles, which is great because um, it's still pretty quick, but um, the CPU is not going to burn any energy, um, you know, on that thread in this time because nothing's happening. It's just basically store, like pausing the CPU. And if you're like on a uh, somewhat um, recent uh, Intel chip, then you're going to have hyper-threading. So it's even better because you have like two threads that can, can go through the same CPU pipeline. And um, so if one of the threads is pausing, then the other thread gets to actually do it do its stuff in the same time. So you're benefiting from hyper-threading here. So, so that's like a really efficient way of um, just like basically doing this like waiting, but not like in a busy waiting way that burns energy, but just basically not burning energy and also letting another thread do some work on that core. So now Bryce is doing that 12 more times. And then if that still fails, then okay, then probably we need to wait for even longer so we're going to do something else. We're going to actually yield from this thread. I'm going to say, hey, thread scheduler, maybe let another thread try to do its stuff. And you're going to come back later. And if that fails um, a few times as well, then you're actually going to start putting the thread to sleep and wait for like successively longer periods of time. So um, there's a, the, the, like as a strategy, like this is great. This is like a, a good way of, of approaching the problem in principle to have these like progressively longer and more energy uh, efficient uh, like stages of waiting. If you look a bit closer at this, there are a few problems. Um, like one thing that I don't like about this implementation, for example, is that you have this for loop around it and then if clauses inside. So that's actually turns out is not good for the optimizer. It's particularly not good for the branch predictor because um, you know every time you go from one stage to the next, the branch predictor is gonna have a mispredict and then going to take a while for it to readjust and you're just wasting time again. So, so you would have to like probably better to like do an, a, a, a like different loop for every stage. But then the much bigger problem is that this is Linux specific or like, so the um, inline assembly in the second line is going to work on a Mac, but it's not going to work for Visual Studio because Visual Studio doesn't let us do inline assembly anymore. Thanks Visual Studio. Um, and then the rest of the code is just really Linux specific stuff. So that's not going to work on another pl uh, platform at all. And that's not really what we want, because even though this is, we're still like specifically doing code for like Intel chips here, which we're going to talk about other stuff later. 
you really, you know, if you're like doing plugins or DAWs or any kind of music software, you probably want this to work on, on Linux and, and Mac and Windows, or at least Mac and Windows, definitely. Um, and hopefully also Linux. Um, so then we need to re-implement this for every platform we care about. That's no one's going to do that. So in his talk, Bryce actually says, well, there is a, in C++20 with a new library, there is a cross-platform way of doing this using um, like this, where you have, um, so Split Atomic actually has a new interface in C++20 where you have uh, these wait and notify methods. And the idea here is that um, you're just going to do this like wait and notify on this atomic flag. And then basically now it's the um, compiler vendor's job or the standard library vendor's job to implement the stuff that we've seen on the previous slide basically under the hood. And you don't have to worry about that. It's going to work on the platform. So that's great in principle, but there is no guarantee that the vendor is going to um, implement it um, in, in this particular way, which is real time safe. So I heard from at least one. Uh, standard library uh, implementer that they would probably use like a few tags, like with uh, with a try lock, um, or at least that's like a feasible strategy. You don't really know as a user, and that's again, not real time safe. And then on another platform, you might have something else. You don't know. So like, like everything else in the C++ library, this is probably not real time safe. Uh, it's probably there's gonna be some system calls in there. So you can't really use that for audio, like on the, real, on the audio thread. So unfortunately, sorry, Bryce, this implementation is not going to work for us. So, OK, let's go back to this. So this is the Linux thing again. Um, turns out, um, even if we were to like port something like this to Mac and Windows, this specific idea here, like the idea with the stages is, is fine. But like the way this is done here is actually tuned for a different scenario, right? So. Remember, this is not written by audio people. This is written by you know people who do graphics and kernel development and maybe algorithmic trading and, and gaming and things like that. And uh, this specific implementation, uh, which came from from Bryce, who works at Nvidia, is actually tuned for um, a scenario where you have like high contention, right? So you have it means you have many cores, you have many threads, you have maybe dozens or even hundreds of threads, and they're all contending for this lock. And in this particular scenario, this implementation is great because it's not just efficient, it's also fair. So it kind of distributes, like uh, prioritizes these like 100 threads that are all waiting for the same lot, um, like in a fair way. Turns out when we're doing audio, we don't really have this scenario. Like we are not really dealing with high contention. Like every single uh, you know use case I've seen where people put locks in, in audio code, we only have really two threads going on. We have the audio thread, which is doing real-time processing, and we have one other thread which wants to modify something or read something or write something that the audio thread is using. Whether it's like the GUI thread or like network thread or some background worker thread, it's typically just one other thread. Um, so we only have two threads. We don't have this like 100 threads like contention scenario. Um, so we're probably going to use like different numbers and different stages um, to kind of optimize it for our use case. And obviously, we also want this to be cross-platform. So we want this to work on Mac and Windows. So let's do something about that. Turns out like you don't have to use um, inline assembly. If you look into the Intel developer manual, there is uh, you can use intrinsics. There's this intrinsics, mmpause, which turns out does exactly the same thing, except it's available on all the platforms that we care about. So if you include this um, intrinsics header and you, you do this um, intrinsic here, it's going to insert exactly the same instruction, but on Windows, on Mac, and on Linux. So that's great. So the scheduled is, again, like a Linux call. Um, there is actually a standard portable C++ way of doing this, which is this red yield, which is doing pretty much the same thing. Um, and there's like sleeping stuff at the end. Let's forget about that for the moment. Um, so um, we're going to talk about sleeping later. Let's look at these three stages. So we have spin, pause, and yield, basically. These are our three progressive back off stages. Now, in this implementation, we have these magic numbers there, right? Like 4, 16, 64. Like, where the heck do these come from? Like, who, who tuned them and like how? And, and, and are these good numbers for us or not? And um, so obviously, I don't like magic numbers. Um, so I try to look at this from the through the lens of like audio development and 
the first step really I thought was to like get a feel for how long these stages actually take, right? And the only way to figure this out is to measure. So we have spin, pause, and yield, and I just want to know how long do these take? Like how long does one iteration around the loop take? And um, so in order to measure this, um, so I'm using catch two for all my unit testing, which is great. And it turns out catch two also has benchmark facilities. So that's even better. Um, so I wrote like a little test harness around this and like a little setup where you can actually like um, execute these different stages in a scenario where you actually have a lock going on, like with the spinning on like another thread doing some stuff. Um, I'm not going to show that code here because um, writing unit tests for asynchronous code um, is not trivial. It's quite a mouthful. It's, it's fun, but it's complicated. So I'm not going to go into how to like test um, asynchronous uh, concurrent code. That's like a whole talk in itself. Um, and I myself have a lot to learn about that still. So, but I, I put together uh, basically a, a relatively simple setup to, to test this. And then I just figured like just measured how long each stage takes. And, and these are the results on the two uh, machines that I had available at the time. So at the time, um, we were already in lockdown when I did this. So I only had the two machines that I, I use at home, um, which is I have my Dell, uh, which is Dell XPS, which is my main development machine, which is what I use for coding. And then I have my MacBook, which is the other machine, which is the one that I use for making music. And um, turns out both of them have exactly the same CPU in them. It's like, you know, pretty new, pretty like high end six core i9. Um, so which is great. So it's the same CPU. So, so um, and then I tested like all three um, operating systems that we care about, which is Windows, Mac, and Linux. So Windows and Linux obviously on the Dell and then Mac on the Mac. Um, yeah, and then it turns out um, spin, pause, and yield. Um, so spin uh, and pause take the same time across these machines, unsurprisingly, because it's the same, same CPU architecture. So it turns out the spin takes about five nanoseconds. Um, pause takes about an order of magnitude more than that. So it's about 40. 40 nanoseconds, one pause instruction. And if you get to the yield, it's one, uh, one order of magnitude still uh, slower. But then we have a little bit of a scatter here because yield is the threat scheduler. So that's your operating system, right? So that's going to be implemented slightly differently on Windows, Mac, and Linux. So that's why, why we see like a little bit of scatter here, but not that much actually. So it's something around like between three and 500 nanoseconds. So we can say to a good approximation that um, you know, very much true to the idea of exponential back off, like every stage is going to take one order of magnitude longer than the previous one. So that's what we want here. That's, that's great. Um, so um, when I first published this, um, I had um, a piece of feedback um, from someone who was saying, yeah, but the, so you're using like one particular architecture here, but actually this MM pause, the, the pause instruction on Intel actually varies wildly between different chipsets. So you might actually get like an order of magnitude difference in uh, the pause instruction, uh, how long it takes if you try this on like a different type of Intel chip. And I was like, hmm, okay, um, let's try this. So I actually tried this just yesterday uh, because now I have, um, now that we are locked down, everyone works from home. So I have like all my setup that I need for the current project that I'm involved in. I have that here at home. So I have a few more machines. So specifically I have like another low end PC um, which is just like a very cheap, like mini PC with like an Intel setter on in it. And then I have a low end Mac as well, which is, so I got like this old, um, old Mac mini from 2014, which has like a rather slow CPU and also like different chip. Um, so I use them basically just for testing, but hey, I can use them to test this. Um, it turns out, yes, there is a difference. Um, so specifically on the Mac mini, uh, the, the one with like this, much older CPU, the pause is not an order of magnitude, less time, but more like factor of three. So I would argue that that doesn't make too much of a difference. It's not gonna, like later you're gonna see like the implementation that I wrote and it's not gonna, I think, make a critical difference in how it performs, but yeah, it's a significant difference. So maybe not 
really relevant, but also I have to say, I didn't test this on an Intel Atom or an Intel Core to Duo. I remember when I had like Intel Core to Duo laptop, like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and then I was comparing that with like the newer i5, i7, i9 stuff. Like there were really weird differences with other types of in instructions, like how long they would take. Um, so maybe it's going to look different in some of these architectures. I don't have these machines here. I can't really test them now. Um, but like overall, I think it's not actually that relevant. Um, so the picture doesn't look that too different. So I think we can still say kind of each phase is roughly taking an order of magnitude longer than the previous one. So that's good. But let's look at this yield again. So that's kind of weird. So the yield takes something around 500 nanoseconds. So when I first saw this, I was really actually puzzled by this because I thought if you do a thread yield, what it's going to do is it's going to um, you know, yield from that thread. So another thread is going to take over. So that thread is going to miss its, its time slice right, in the, in the thread schedule. And a time slice is something about 10 and 100 milliseconds. So I would have expected a yield to take up that much amount of time. right? So instead, it's just 500 nanoseconds. So what the heck is going on here? Uh, didn't really quite understand it in the beginning, but then I um, did another test where um, instead of just running my little unit test with the benchmark, I was actually, um, I tried to recreate like a more realistic scenario where I took this whole benchmark and put this into a plugin. Now, so compiled it as like a VST plugin. And then I put that VST plugin into a DAW and then I put like 20 other plugins onto different tracks in the same door. And then I just like loaded some stuff, which is like really expensive, like maybe some convolution reverb, which we found out, you know, sounds maybe has a bit too much presence. But the point here was that it, you know, consumes a lot of CPU cycles. So that was kind of what I, what I was going for. And then I had like other applications open, like, you know, Slack and like my email client and a bunch of other stuff. And I just like ran the benchmark in this like more realistic scenario, which is like how I would actually use my machine if I were to like make music. Um, and it turns out, yes, in this scenario, um, the yield will actually sometimes um, yield. And then sometimes it's going to take 10 milliseconds or even 30 milliseconds, which means, yes, the thread, actually the audio thread, or not the audio thread, the, the main thread, which was waiting on the spin, um, actually got scheduled out, missed the time slice, another thread came in, and then the thread came back like on the next time slice. Um, so that's what you would see. But actually, it turns out that it was not actually happening that often. It would only happen like about once a second or so. You know, maybe it's because I have like a six core machine. Um, maybe like on the Mac Mini, it would look different. Maybe it would happen more often. But anyway, like 99% of the time, the yield would, would not take 10 or 30 milliseconds, it would take these 500 nanoseconds, even in this like busy, I'm actually trying to produce music here kind of scenario. Um, what does that mean? So what's actually going on here? Like, so we have this yield, what, what is this actually doing? If this is not really doing anything, if most of the time we are not actually going to be yielding. So what's going to happen if you call this yield is, well, okay, so you say, I want to yield, so you thread your, you tell your operating system the, the thread scheduler that you want to yield. So the operating system is going to say, okay, I'm going to switch to kernel mode, the context switch. Okay, you want to yield? Okay, cool. I'm going to suspend the thread. I'm going to put it to the, all the way to the back of the run queue. But hey, there's actually no other thread in the run queue at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to like actually immediately resume this thread again and context switch back, and and then. You know, the loop goes around another time. You're going to do this again and again and again and again, right? Which means you just are back in a busy loop, right? You're just going to back, you're back in the, like, the first stage again. We're just going to, uh, you're just like burning CPU cycles in, in a loop, which is, which is doing nothing useful at all, right? So you're just burning cycles. So this is like the primitive spin lock again, except it's actually worse because now you're actually involving the kernel as well and you're switching between kernel and user space all the time. So this is actually a really bad idea in this scenario where we don't have high contention, where we're doing audio. Um, so let's not yield in a loop. Let's yield maybe once in a while. So let's say we have the audio callback going on. Um, and maybe one round uh, through the audio graph is going to take one millisecond, right? That's like realistic 
uh, uh, if you're like, if you have like a busy thing that's doing a lot, like it's going to take you maybe one millisecond to produce the whole buffer if you have a lot going on. That's like a realistic number that I saw in benchmarks. So let's say like more or less one millisecond, like that order of magnitude. And then you, if you're looping, if you're waiting for your um, lock on the other thread and you didn't get it for like one millisecond, for like more than one millisecond, then you should start to become suspicious. Then you're like, okay, if, if you're waiting more than one millisecond for this lock, then probably the audio thread would have finished its work by then. And if you still didn't get the lock, then maybe something weird is going on. Maybe you're under very high load. Maybe there's like other threads doing stuff. Uh, maybe you should yield, right? And just so, you know, if, if this happens repeatedly, then your GUI thread is going to miss a frame or two frames, which is probably not going to matter in that scenario because you have clearly have like something else going on, something weird. Or maybe the thread scheduler is doing something weird. You don't know. Anyway, maybe every one millisecond or so, you want to re-yield just in case to basically protect yourself from some you know, threat scheduling weirdness or like system overload stuff um, so that the GUI thread is not like locking up everything else. Um, but then once you feel that you want to go back to, to, to spinning basically, uh, to like do, uh, the pause, the pause. So that's where you want to spend most of your time. And so we say we don't want to yield in a loop um, and then Talking about sleeping, you actually don't want to sleep either because a sleep is just a yield and then a wait, right? Um, so that's not going to be useful here either. And actually, sleep has another problem. So let's say um, the callback, um, as we said, is, is going to get called every one millisecond, let's say. And then maybe you're at 90% CPU consumption, right? Because you're doing a lot of expensive convolution verbs, for example. Um, so you're going to get called every one millisecond and 90% of that time you're going to be churning numbers in the audio thread. So you only have a 100 microsecond uh, window for another thread to jump in and grab the lock. So if you're going to sleep for 100 microseconds, then you're probably going to miss that window of time, which is very narrow. You're going to miss it again and again and again and again. And then your GUI is going to get laggy. Um, it's going to, you know, your GUI is going to freeze basically. You don't want that um, to happen. So let's not sleep for our use case. So, okay, it's slowly starting to emerge how you want to tweak uh, like the original like Linux block that we saw before for like specific audio stuff. So let's look again at our use cases here. So this is kind of three examples that I picked out where you know people were using Trilog, which we now know we shouldn't be using, um, which I want to replace with uh, our new spin lock, which is. Um, real-time safe and also energy efficient. How long are these things going to take? Like if in, in the each use case, how, for how long is the audio thread going to be busy for? Turns out if you are like traversing a vector, check if the vector is empty, like a check like that, I benchmarked it and my machine is gonna take maybe 25 nanoseconds. You know, it could be different. It's just like very rough. Um, kind of like, this is what I saw in this particular benchmark kind of thing. And then if you just have like a handful of elements in that vector, just like looping through them and getting like your pointer back, then that might be something like one microsecond, probably not longer than that. And then obviously if you have like a vector with like a thousand elements, then it's going to take longer and longer and longer. And then at the extreme end um, of the spectrum, you might be um, processing the whole audio graph which you know, in this particular um, very like CPU intensive plugin that I was working with would take like one millisecond to go one way around the audio graph. So you have basically more than five orders of magnitude of how long you might be waiting for this lock if you're the GUI thread. And the lock has to kind of work for all of these, right? So that's why we're gonna have to have these like progressive stages going on. And that's how we're gonna tune our numbers. So, so let's implement our new lock. So, as I said, um, let's not have a for loop around everything, but let's have like a for loop for every stage because that's better for the branch predictor. So let's start with the um, stage one. Stage one is just the spin lock, which is just going to do the, the, the busy wait, which is like the fastest thing because it's like five nanoseconds for one try, right? So um, yeah, so let's do that maybe five times. Um, that's just really a number that I kind of, chosen, I could have chosen a num different number. It's like not five is not particularly, it's nothing special about the number five. It's just, if the audio thread is doing something very simple, like, you know, 
checking if a vector is empty, that just takes this amount of time. So maybe if you're in this scenario, we're just gonna like really quickly grab the log, not doing anything more sophisticated. So we're gonna like spin five times uh, for this amount of time. Now, if that fails, okay, the audio thread is doing something maybe a bit more involved. So we're gonna go to stage two, and now we're gonna do this pause, right? So now in this pause, we're gonna try to get the log. If that fails, we're gonna insert one pause instruction. And we're gonna do that in a loop. So uh, the pause is great. Um, turns out, so, so here I'm doing this like 10 times. Um, and that's the number where, okay, if the audio thread is doing something um, maybe which is not like primitive, not trivial, it's not a no-op, but it's some quick operation, you know, it might finish during this time. Um, but this stage really has a problem still. So the pause instruction is really efficient. Um, but if you implement it like this, it turns out that the stage two is still going to spend 10 times, 10% CPU time doing stuff because we have a loop and we have a counter. So I measured this and it turns out MM pause is going to, you know, stall the CPU for like uh, 300 something nanoseconds or whatever it was, but uh, like, sorry, 30 nanoseconds. Um, but then um, you're going to have a loop counter, which you need to increment, and then you have to like jump and then you know do that. And, and that takes about 10% of the time in this particular loop on this particular machine. So we are still burning 10% energy. It's better than 100%, but we can do even better than that. And so for our stage three, we're going to um, do basically 10 pause instructions in a row. And this is a bit annoying. I actually have to write them out because if I put them in a loop, then um, some compilers, I, I check the like GCC, Clang, and, and MSVC on Godbolt. I think GCC, I'm not, I remember, like either GCC or Clang, one of the two was the one that wouldn't um, basically would roll it into a loop and introduce an extra counter, uh, which is not what you want. If you want like literally 10, 10 instructions here because you're gonna pause for like that amount of time. So we have to write them out, which is mildly annoying, but okay. And that stage now, you uh, basically reduce the overhead of doing stuff from 10% to 1%, right? Because you're doing like 10, 10 pauses in a row. And this is really great. So um, this is where you really want to spend most of your time waiting in this loop, because this is basically not going to consume pretty much any energy at all. And other threads can make progress at the same time. So that's where you want to be. That's like the green stage three. And so we're going to stay in stage three for about one millisecond, which is what we think is the order of magnitude of how long we should wait for this lock to be acquired before we should really start getting worried about the audio thread because it hasn't returned in a while. So that's weird. So something weird is going on. So maybe we should yield uh, just to protect us from like some threat scheduling weirdness or some other stuff that's going on. And then we yield once, we don't yield in a loop, we yield once and then we just go back to the beginning of stage three and, and loop in these like 10 pauses again. Um, and yeah, so we're going back to like the um, kind of energy efficient thing. And, and yeah, that's basically it. Um, that's kind of what I implemented here. Uh, like the only thing that is kind of not nice, we still have magic numbers here. I don't like magic numbers. So I'm going to put them into like an array at the beginning. And then I put like a big comment there explaining um, where these um, numbers come from and what timings they correspond to. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much uh, my spin lock um, for Linux, Mac, and Windows for x86. Um, that's what I'm using currently in production code. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, we saw, like, obviously, I benchmarked this on this particular CPU, which is like a very high end CPU. Uh, when you get to, like, obviously, this has to work across consumer hardware, where, you know, if someone's buying a plugin, they might have an older Mac or an older PC, uh, or maybe this is just a smaller laptop that consumes less energy. And then they're going to have different measurements. So I don't think it matters too much. I think it's still fine because it's still going to be roughly within the same order of magnitude. But to make this like really if, more efficient, um, we can do a few improvements. So first of all, um, 
you know, you really want to tune this for the machine you're running on. What you can do is like on startup of your application, you can do one little benchmark to see how long the pause instruction takes. And you can just like slightly adjust the numbers, uh, you know, how, um, how, how long you want to spend like in stage two and stage three, um, how many iterations uh, to adjust that kind of for the CPU pause duration that is actually happening on the machine you're running on. So you can do that in startup. And then every time you get like this callback, which tells you, um, I'm going to do processing now. Here's what the buffer size and the sample rate is going to be, which on juice is going to be called prepared to play. So then you know how long uh, an audio callback is going to take, like the maximum amount of time it's allowed to take. So with that number, you can, um, again, like tune your, your spin lock even a little bit more precisely. And then I'm not really convinced this is necessary, but you know, some people have pointed out that you might want to do that. So yeah, I haven't done that yet. This is like another exercise that I might do in the future. Um, and then obviously the more important thing is that everything we saw so far is specific for Intel chips for x86, sorry, x64, 64-bit architecture. But now obviously we live in a different world. So as we already mentioned several times today, Apple is going for ARM chips this year. Uh, you know, uh, we all got our um, uh, developer transition kits now and we're trying to port our scrambling to port our stuff to ARM. So obviously I will need to go ahead and implement this for ARM, um, which I don't think is going to be difficult. So ARM has um, like two kind of instructions which are interesting here. It's like WFI and WFE, wait for interrupt and wait for event. And it looks like WFE is the one to use here. So actually the ARM documentation actually even says this is what you should be using for spin locks. Uh, if you go into their like CPU manual, um, so that's, I think, um, the equivalent of the pause instruction on ARM. So probably it's just going to be a matter of like plugging that in and maybe tuning the numbers a little bit um, or just using the auto tune thing um, if I have it at that point. And hopefully it's going to be a very smooth um, port to ARM. But I haven't actually done any of the stuff yet. I'm not sure if I'm going to run into any unexpected problems. So, so let's see. And yeah, obviously the other uh, future work is um, basically to do all this and then publish it on GitHub. So it's going to be open source and freely available. And um, I haven't done that yet either. Um, so right now this spin lock thing sits in the middle of this project I'm working on, which is like currently closed source code. So I definitely, definitely want to like, you know, take this and like other kind of low, low level utilities that we've written there, kind of like uh, move them out and like put them into like a standalone library and put that on GitHub and make this free and, and open source. But haven't got around to do that yet. So I'm going to see how I'm going to go about that. But hopefully that can happen um, soon as well. Right, so that's basically uh, future work on this. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty much at the end of the talk. Like the last thing I want to say is um, I want to thank uh, three particular people, these friends of mine who um, really helped me a lot with preparing this and figuring out how, how to write this. And we're so patiently um, you know, answering all my questions, hey, how does this code do? Uh, what does this piece of code do? And how does this work? And actually telling me a lot of things that I didn't know before. So thank you very much, Gasper and Dave and Fabian for um, teaching me things. Um, um, yeah, and that's it. And this is how uh, you can use locks in real-time audio processing. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Timur, for your talk. Uh, we have... <clears throat> couple questions from our community. So the first question is from Jean Miguel. Instead of updating the graph structure itself, what do you think of sending commands that will be modifying the structure of the graph as std function on the audio thread? Oh, OK. Very interesting question. Thank you. So there's quite a few things here. So first of all, std function specifically. Um, oh, before, before you answer, you want to unshare your, uh, your screen? Oh, yeah. Um, how do I hang on? I, as I said, I've not done this before. Um, how, ah, hang on. So I need to oh, now I have a mouse cursor again. Stop share. There you go. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Great. Okay. So, so first of all, this is like an aside. Please don't use std function for real time stuff yeah. because it's like a type erasure thing. But in C 23, we're going to get um, a new thing. It used to be called function ref. I think now they called it. Um, Oh, we had like a long discussion on the committee about this. Um, 
some someone said any any function any invocable i think is the current name for it but i'm not sure it's final but and it's also not in c plus plus yet so we're going to get it in 23 i suspect um it's not going to do the type erasure thing it's like a like a safer safer version of it oh sorry it's going to do the, the type erasure thing but it's move only so you're not mm. going to be copying that thing yeah. on the audio. that's can just never happen so it's like a lot safer and I'm pretty sure there's going to be implementations of that flying around like way before C++ and anything comes out. So that that's an aside. Your actual question, um, very interesting. So I said in the beginning, actually don't do any of the stuff. You use immutable data structures. That's my actual recommendation. If, you, if you're writing new code, don't yeah. do any of this. Um, but now actually someone else, um, like a colleague of mine, pointed out to me recently that there's yet another approach, which is just like, data driven it's called i think data i don't remember there was like a gaming person who i also don't remember the name of gave a um talk about that at cppcon last year where they like wrote the whole game engine with this approach where you don't actually even have an immutable data structure you don't have anything at all you just have these messages which encode like the changes in the structure and you just exchange those messages and i think that's what you were getting at right yeah, yeah, yeah. and this is super cool and um I have to say I have not had time to pro like explore this idea yet, okay. and it might like this. Uh, this guy wrote like a whole game engine with this approach, and it seems to work for them. And they say it's like super efficient and super nice. I have not had time to research that yet, but like it's definitely on my list um, of things okay. like to try out. Like maybe that's maybe that's the, the the best way of solving this. So I can't answer your question really because I haven't looked into this, but I am aware of it, and it might be a great solution and um there will be future work in this space but cool. i don't know the answer yet but if you find out please let me know because i'm super curious about this stuff okay well that, that's what i'm using currently in osia but I'm, I'm always wondering if it's the right thing you know or yeah. so yeah <laughs> oh, so you are actually using it okay so what's your experience with this um well one big thing one big problem was uh guaranteeing atomicity of big change. And I think one thing that we aren't getting is, you know, that transactional memory thing. Um, for that, that will be really useful because you have sometimes multiple commands that and got changes, but sometimes you need multiple commands to actually, um, they are part of a bigger command. So you put them in a vector or stuff like that, but that's not very satisfying, I think. But all the way, I, I'm always, yeah, on the fence on whether it's, there is something lost maybe somewhere in terms of pair for or something like that. I but mean, at the end of the day, if you're doing real time stuff, like the only synchronization primitive that you ever have is still atomic, right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Anything else. So at the end of the day, it has to boil down to like an atomic pointer swap somewhere, yeah, which yeah. if you have like a whole structure built like around this, it's relatively mm. easy to implement it that way. And like Juanpe has like libraries which implement this. If you're doing this like event space stuff, I think it's going to get more tricky. So I'm really like, I would like maybe not now, but I'm curious to like see how you actually solve this. And okay, well, let's talk about it another day. <laughs> let's talk about this another time. But yeah. Great. Um, so we have a fa uh, a question from uh, Fabian Rangiles. Why is C plus plus twenties flag wait problematic? It's only called in lock, which is only used on the GUI thread, right? But it's the same thing as with the try lock. Like yes. But uh, you have the notify, and the notify is going to do the same thing as the unlock, which is potentially waking up another thread. OK. Uh, maybe, have... that, maybe, maybe I got a, the question wrong also. I'm not sure if I. Hmm. Uh, we have, if, if the question's wrong, Fabian, feel free to uh, clarify. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll come back to it. Uh, so we have a question from Archie. I'm not sure if I understand this, but maybe you do. Are things any better when developing audio applications on hard real-time systems? And if yes, why aren't we getting more hard, hard real-time support from desktop OS vendors? Right. So I have to admit that I have exactly zero experience with hard real-time systems. You know, there's obviously stuff like like the Bella and like other like things like that, right? That's probably what you're what you're talking about. Hmm. I have never developed any code for these systems. I just don't really have any experience with them. Uh, so I can't really comment on that. I would be curious to hear from an expert. With regards to desktop um, platforms though, how would you, like the problem is that, um, so so the problem, if you do um, like on 
development for audio software on desktop and mobile. We, we're doing this like impossible thing where we are uh, developing real-time software on a non-real-time kernel, right? That's like the fundamental contradiction. Like none of what we're doing is actually even supposed to work really. Um, and the problem is that yes, it's a non-real-time kernel because it's the Linux kernel, it's the Windows kernel, it's the it's the Mac kernel, and, and they're not gonna rewrite their whole operating systems kernel for audio people. So I just don't like this is just such a fundamental part of how you you know architecture the the kernel of an operating system. I don't think that well okay well. Again, I'm not a kernel expert, so I think Linux and maybe someone like Fabian can comment on this better. Maybe I think Linux has some facilities around, like saying, "Okay, this thread is a real-time thread, like really," and then the operating system is gonna do its best to like make sure that this thread is not interrupted. And I think maybe there's even some guarantees around that on Linux. I think this is what Fabian told me last time we talked about this. Um, on Mac and Windows, it's just kind of a black box. So unless they say this and this is real time safe, it's just not. And like, they're not going to rewrite their kernel to like do that. So yeah, I don't know. I probably haven't answered the question, but basically desktop isn't really made for this, right? So we're doing this weird thing that we're not supposed to do on desktop platforms anyway. So yeah, I think, yeah, I, I don't think there's a satisfactory solution. We need to like keep doing stuff like this to kind of stay afloat you know I, I really don't have a better answer right now maybe someone else has okay so a uh, question from will william light for the yield test did you tune the thread priorities uh such as sketch fifo on linux no i did not um this is um something that i would have to do in like a more detailed benchmark which i didn't have time to do but um I guess in the case where it was just a benchmark where it was just spinning and doing nothing else, it wouldn't make any difference. I think on the on the high load case, um, I think it would make a difference. But then the high load case, I tested with like a DAW and a plugin where the, the thread that you get is like at the mercy of, you know, something like juice or like, I guess you could set it up in that way that you could test it, but it's not trivial. And I haven't done that particular test yet. So unfortunately, I don't know. Okay. And Fabian says, uh, I'm wondering if there's a way to improve this by collecting heuristics from when the audio thread is running slash sleeping, which would be super regular, then the spin lock could predict when the audio thread is asleep, and hence is not contending the lock, the UI thread could then sleep until the lock is expected to be free. That's a really interesting suggestion. I didn't think about that. That's super clever. Thank you, Fabian. So I was thinking about just saying, okay, if you get the prepare to play callback, we know what the, the frequency of one callback is. So we can use that. But now you're saying we could actually we actually know how much load we have. Like we know how long, not not how long is between one callback and the next, but how long one callback takes. So that's actually a much more useful number um, to tune this. So yeah, that's a great idea. Um, that would be yeah, that would be good. Yeah. Um, what, 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 one question about that, though, I mean, it's so important on the comments. Is that going to be regular, especially if you're like um, not necessarily in real time, but rendering offline? Yeah. And, you know, because I, I know in some cases the block cha cha block sizes change, but does prepare to play, does it look at each individual block or does it like just kind of like at the beginning of like? Yeah. So prepare to play gives you the sample rate and buffer size. So you can work out from there. How much time is between a callback, assuming that you're doing real time? If you're doing offline rendering, then that's completely wrong, as you say, and and something completely different is going on. So you would have to account for that case. But then in that case, you don't really care about the GUI and these locks, and it's really not such a problem anyway. I think. Yeah. So you just need to kind of like special case that somehow, and maybe that's just you know actually now I think with your comment and Fabian's comment. Like using the prepare to play to tune this is probably just not a good idea. What you should do instead is what Fabian said is try to figure out how long one callback takes to complete and use that. That's that's a much better idea, I think. Hmm. Okay, we got a question from <clears throat> J.R. Kirby. Uh, would immutable data structures be a different way of saying the tech the same technique as double buffering from computer graphics? Mm. So well, they're related, I guess. 
Um, so it's similar, except that in double buffering, you go back and forth between two copies, basically. Mm -hmm. Whereas with uh, immutable data structures, whenever you have any change, you just peel off a completely new copy every time. Um, but I guess some of the kind of under the hood stuff would probably be similar in a way you do like a pointer swap to actually publish the new version of the data structure that would be probably similar so there's similarities between them okay great looks like we're all good on the questions so uh this is a good time for us to wrap up and uh thank you once again to everybody that tuned in uh to all of the talks and thank you once again to our guest presenters uh jean miguel uh, Evan, who had to run, uh, Sean, and of course, Teamer. And thank you to our sponsors, Juice, Focusrite, and Sonux for uh, contributing to make this meetup possible. Uh, do we have any anything to sign off with, Teamer? Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, we are looking for talks. So we have um, basically the next meetup in August sorted out. As I said, we're going to have the special theme night about different programming languages, which I'm really excited about. But from September on, we basically don't yet know whom we're going to host here. So um, please um, submit your ideas. And it doesn't matter if you're like a seasoned pro and you tell us about the last 20 years of audio software, or if you're like a student or a beginner and just want to share something you discovered or something you're learning or anything in between. It doesn't matter if you've given 20 talks before. If it's your first talk, it can be short, it can be long, it can be live, it can be pre-recorded. It can be about whatever you think is interesting for this community. Yeah. Um, it's all welcome. So please submit ideas and <clears throat> get on here, do your talk and, and be part of this thing. And that would be amazing. And I think the URL for doing this is... Theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash submit. So, there you go. and I need to improve that page to make it a little bit more comprehensive for us. Um, so yes, please, please don't be afraid to uh, submit a proposal for us. As Timur said, we encourage uh, a range. As you can see, we have a wide variety of, of uh, experience levels that have participated in this evening's meetup and that we encourage, especially if you haven't given a talk before, please come. We'd love to see your work uh, and your ideas. Uh, also, be sure to join our audio programmer community. So we have over 3,600 people now in the Discord. And uh, you can find that at theaudioprogrammer.com forward slash community. Uh, what else do we have? So we have the meetup next month, which is 11th of August. Is that right? Yeah, Tuesday, yeah. the 11th of August. It's always yeah. the second Tuesday of the month. Yes. So second Tuesday of the month. And uh, another thing that I've forgotten to announce a little bit earlier is that we will be doing a live uh, podcast on the 28th of July. Uh, I'm going to be doing a live podcast with uh, Mads from Audio Kinetic. Uh, so they do the uh, W uh, the Wise plugin format, which is primarily for game audio and middleware. And we're going to be talking more about game audio. So uh, be sure to join in on that if you're around 28th of uh, July. And I'll be putting out some more information on that. So I know it's a lot of information to digest. But uh, yeah, I'm sure everybody's uh, brain's pretty much fried by now. Uh, if you're anything like me, uh, <laughs> we've We've done a whistle stop tour of basically the world of audio programming all in about the space of three and a half, four hours. Uh, so <laughs> once again, thank you very much to, uh, to everybody that tuned in and, uh, do we have anything, anything else, Timur, before we sign uh, off? No, except, um, oh, also give us your feedback. If you have any suggestions how to improve this, um, oh yeah. And yeah, with that, like, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. It's such a, Pleasure to be here um, and see you next month. Yeah, we really appreciate you and we will see you next month. Thank you. Bye bye, thanks. Great.